City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday 27th of June 2017. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be, up, may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. The Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosperous deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Members, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, uh, continue to stand in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in the defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air. Members, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <coughs> Members, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Council meeting of Tuesday the 27th of June 2016. 17. 17. Thank you very much, CEO. The uh, apologies and leave of absence item 5 in your agendas. Uh, we have nil, so we have a full compliment. I presume that Councillor Antic is in transit soon to join us. Members, item 6 on your agendas is confirmation of minutes from the last meeting held on the 13th of June 2017. Can I please have a mover to adopt those minutes, members? Councillor Milani, seconded by. Councillor Vershaw, any debate members? Members, those to adopt, those in favour of adopting those minutes, those in favour, those against, we carry the minutes from the meeting held on the 13th of June 2017. Thank you, members. Members, item seven on your agendas is public forum deputations of which we have no requests for either or. And furthermore, we have no requests for a petition, which is item eight on your agenda. So I'll take you directly to item nine on your agendas, which is advice from APLA from the meeting held on the uh, 22nd of June, 2017. Members, there's two pieces of advice, one and two, is to uh, receive a note. Uh, members, can I have a mover to accept the advice from Apple? Councillor Maloney, seconded by Councillor Abiyad. Councillor Maloney, any queries or questions? Councillor Abiyad? No. Members, to the floor. Councillor Maloney, to sum up. No. Members, I put before you those in favour. <coughs> those against, we carry the advice of Apple. Thank you very much, members. Members, I take you to item 10, which is the Lord Mayor's report. Uh, members, you would have seen uh, the state budget uh, released last week, and uh, whilst we maybe not were uh, entirely successful in every endeavour, most particularly we were eager to see some form of investment into Grenfell Street as a consequence of the increased uh, bus traffic soon to be a result of the completion of Oban. 
Conversely, we were successful members with regards to the continuation of the stamp duty concessions, a new $10,000 pre-construction grant, and also the state government adding a five-year land tax moratorium for those that buy off the plan as an investor. Now, members, this complements your motion uh, from several weeks back with regards to five years uh, rate-free off the plan for those that own or occupy. So the state has reciprocated uh, and our motion is complete. So we thank the state for that. Members, uh, recently Councillor Vershaw, Councillor Aviard and myself attended the Capital City, uh, Capital City Committee meeting. Uh, and also at that meeting on the 8th of June, we confirmed the forward work program, which will be discussed, and that's also in your papers in the Capital City Committee section of your papers later in this agenda. Uh, as requested at that Triple C meeting, I raised Councillor Antic's motion of returning the Australian Formula One Grand Prix to the City of Adelaide, and that was duly noted by the members of the Capital City Committee. On the 12th of June, I attended the Volunteers Day thank you event at Adelaide Town Hall. That was on the Monday public holiday with the uh, Honourable Zoe Betterson MP, the Minister for Volunteers. A very well attended and very successful event. Volunteers, obviously members, as we all know, play such an incredibly important role in the City of Adelaide and right across South Australia. As part of Reconciliation Week, I attended the National Sorry Day event in Tartanyunga. Hosted, by, hosted a morning tea to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 1967 referendum and attended the first official event, uh, sorry, and attended the first official event hosted in Adelaide to mark the anniversary of the Mabo case, which was the 25th anniversary this year, and all those events were held at Adelaide Town Hall. Further, in recognition of National Refugee Week, I gave the opening address at the In Our Own Voices event hosted by the Middle Eastern Communities Council of South Australia and the Migrant Resource Centre of, at, also held at Adelaide Town Hall. I also held a Lord Mayoral Afternoon Tea uh, in the Queen Adelaide Room later that day in recognition of Refugee Week. In the past month, I've hosted a civic reception for the Quarter Club. Uh, thank you to the councillors, of which many did who also attended that event, which is a fundraising event for South Australian Olympians. We also held a citizenship ceremony that same day. Following a motion of council, I attended the Environment, Resources and Development Committee of Parliament last week to represent the City of Adelaide's position regarding the North Adelaide Large Institutions and Colleges DPA. The result of that advocacy members will be very soon known to all of us. I, along with Councillor Clarehan and our CEO Mark Goldstone, recently attended the Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly in Canberra, uh, which saw a number of positive outcomes. Most notably, all of the motions which this chamber had put forth were successful uh, in Canberra on the floor of what is arguably a very large council chamber in front of uh, many other local government delegates from around the nation. Yesterday I hosted a, a, uh, the chairman of uh, Perfect China uh, and his delegation for an afternoon tea in the Queen Adelaide Room. Perfect China is currently conducting an incentive tourist event in South Australia for its best sales representatives. And in fact, this is the largest incentive sales group that the City of Adelaide has ever witnessed, around with 3,000 delegates in our city over recent days, which I understand the Rundaball retail community has been a substantial beneficiary. So we thank the Adelaide Convention Bureau, we thank the South Australian Tourism Commission, and we thank our own team here at the City of Adelaide for their significant support of this event, including those from Rundable Management Authority who played a very keen role too. Uh, recently, members of Lady Mayoress hosted a history festival event uh, regarding the history of Lady Mayoress Molden in the Queen Adelaide Room. Over 75 people attended and funds were raised for the Cancer Council of South Australia, of which they were holding their biggest morning tea, uh, or a series of, uh, that week. The Lady Mayoress also spoke at the Historical Society of South Australia event on the 2nd of June, and the Lady Mayoress hosted a Catholic Women's League tour of Adelaide Town Hall on the 6th of June, as well as the Adelaide Society of Collectors on the 22nd of June. The Lady Mayoress also presented a significant cheque to the Magdalen Centre in Moore Street on behalf of the Caritas Corporation, uh, 
uh, which uh, was gratefully received. Coming up, the Lady Mayoress is hosting a morning tea on the 21st of July for the third biennial Royal South Australian Society of Arts uh, Portrait Prize exhibition. Members, uh, in conclusion, um, I would personally and on behalf of all fellow members like to thank uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Megan Hender for her absolutely exemplary work as Deputy Lord Mayor over the last 18 months. Members, please give the Deputy Lord Mayor an applause. Thank you very much, Megan. And uh, we very much look forward to Councillor Vershaw taking on the mantle of Deputy Lord Mayor come the 1st of July. So, and uh, members will be facilitating a handover meeting later this week. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, members. Could I please have a member move that that verbal report be adopted? Councillor Clarehan, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Those in favour? Those against? We carry the verbal presiding member's report. Thank you very much, members. That takes us on to the next item, which would be the council member's report, item 12.1. The, my mistake, we would, sorry, do you? Sorry, my mistake. 11.1. And members, do any of the members wish to do a verbal report before we adopt the written report? Yeah. We don't, so you move it, Councillor Milani. Can I have a second to please, Councillor Corbell? Thank you. All in favour? Those against? So we accept 11.1, which is a report from the council members on page 8. So members, I'll take you straight on to item 12.1, which is a council member report from Councillor Rabiard, delegation to the Middle East and North Africa. Councillor Rabiard, you'd like to move? Yes, happy to move, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Got a second to Councillor Milani. I'll briefly provide council members with a summary. I know I've got three minutes to speak. I don't know if I can cover Middle Eastern politics in three minutes, but uh, I will do my best. Um, obviously, council uh, supported a. Um, State Government delegation to the Middle East um, earlier on this year in March. Uh, I think it was a very positive move for the Adelaide City Council to be able to start looking outside the China-India sort of discussion and also try to not put all our eggs in one basket. I think it's important that we look at other opportunities around the world. We're a very connected world, a um, very digital world, and there's opportunities everywhere in the world, especially for Adelaide and Australia to explore. To put this into context, the Department of Foreign Affairs over the last 12 months have set up an independent embassy in Qatar, they have set up an independent embassy in Morocco, and they have completely restructured their embassy structure in Dubai and Abu Dhabi as well. So even from a federal perspective, uh, the government is really having a different focus when it comes to the Middle East and a renewed effort to connect with the region. Obviously, given the current economic and social uh, global climate around the Arab world, um, I think through cultural understanding and better linkages, we can solve a lot of the issues that we're experiencing today. But most importantly and notably, uh, Minister Chobo in uh, September of 2016 visited Iran and for the first time signed an MOU uh, with the Iranian government, which basically facilitated trade and cultural exchange on a federal level. And that's what prompted the state government to visit Iran recently and the Adelaide City Council to join. Uh, plenty of opportunities uh, around Iran, uh, you could sort of imagine sort of unlocking the beast to some degree around economic development. Almost 90 million people uh, live in that region. Uh, they're all like us. Um, you know, we can agree or disagree with many sort of government structures around the world, but fundamentally when it comes to human to human connection, they all want the same thing, health, food, services, arts, culture. And I've got to say, having lived in the Middle East myself for over 16 years, I've always had a very bleak look into Iran through the TV and through the internet, but surprisingly on the ground, uh, men, women, children are in the playgrounds, they're playing sports. Uh, they're a highly educated community, um, highly involved in the banking sector, but there's some incredible opportunities around what Iran can deliver and what can potentially support uh, from an export perspective. Obviously, the region is starved of food, um, so food security, water security, sustainable energy. I would imagine $150 billion they'll be spending in four years on, uh, on renewable structures uh, in, those, uh, in Iran specifically, not to mention Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, and other parts of the world too. Um, but it started in Iran, uh, the trip, and some of the challenges there are really around the banking sector. 
Um, there's a bank on every corner. They're all different banks. Um, sort of, there's been a deregulate, uh, you know, deregulating banks for quite some time in Iran. Uh, so you can't use a Visa card. You can't use a Mastercard in the area. I might seek an extension of there for two minutes. Certainly, councillor members. Um, and yes, two minutes. Thank you, thank you, councillors. Um, and there's some great opportunities there around, obviously, the food, water security discussion, but also education. Um, there's incredible universities uh, in Iran. Uh, they really boast about their female to male ratio attendance in universities, almost 50 to 50 percent. So it's really incredible, the level of education and engagement. And then moving on from there to Dubai, um, we were very lucky overnight to be able to have Paul Vasilev with us. So our Young Australian of the Year, um, and also our South Australian and Adelaide-based business, uh, to be able to showcase this product there on the ground. And there's been some incredible opportunities that I'm sure Paul will be sharing with us very soon uh, around the Middle East and the clientele that he has in the Middle East as a result of his Australian of the Year uh, award, but also as a result of his platform and his brand in South Australia, and specifically in Adelaide. Um, Adelaide and uh, Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi are very established regions for us already. There's heavy business involvement on the ground and trade. Uh, Emirates, in a meeting with, uh, with Emirates, uh, they were very clear that they enjoy a very good relationship with South Australia. They invest heavily here on the ground with over 300 staff members. Uh, but they also have South Australian businesses uh, that they've bought, purchased and run to support airlines uh, in the state. Uh, they have the capacity to transfer about 15 tonnes of produce every day out of South Australia into the region, um, and that's on a daily basis, a significant amount of export of product for our state. Moving on from there to Qatar, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with Hassad Food, the Qatar Investment Authority, the municipality, uh, Ministry of Municipality uh, of Qatar, and also Qatar Airlines and Qatar Airlines CEO. Uh, obviously, through that trip and renewed effort, Qatar Airlines uh, have identified uh, an extra two trips, I believe, to South Australia. Uh, they have the capacity to ship out about 10 tonnes um, a day out of Australia, uh, South Australia, which is also significant for us in connecting to the region. Uh, moving on to Egypt, uh, some of the incredible opportunities there, again, around food and water security. Samax, one of our South Australian-based businesses, Adelaide-based business, have also signed a agreement with the Moroccan army to supply camel meat to the Middle East, believe it or not. Um, so look, uh, in developing, I guess, a MENA strategy for the city of Adelaide really doesn't shift the focus of China or India or any of the other work we're doing culturally also in other cities, uh, but also it's really about us putting all our eggs in different baskets around the region and seeing what opportunities we have for our city uh, and also for our city-based businesses and for cultural linkages. Thank and you, Councillor. Reports will be accepted. You could speak further to it to sum up if you wish. Uh, Councillor Lani, you seconded. You wish to speak to it? Members to the floor. Councillor Martin. Yeah, I have two questions, Lord Mayor. Um, the first is, is that a Snickers bar on the carpet in front of Councillor Aviar? <laughs> and second, will he share it? It is, isn't it? That's why he's grabbing it in with his foot. Yes, okay. And the second question is, would uh, the mover be prepared to take this motion in two parts? Um, I'm happy to, but now I think the impact, I'm just wondering, just looking at the second part, apologies, Councillor. Um, notes the outcomes, notes the other time. It's not a problem. Happy to okay. okay. Look, Mr. Mayor, I, I, um, uh, I wish to speak in, uh, in favour of the first part of the motion. Uh, uh, Councillor Abiyad uh, did a wonderful job uh, on this trade mission. I saw his Facebook postings and uh, the events and uh, functions he attended, uh, and I, uh, I praise him for that. But um, I am concerned that we are considering yet another trade relationship. Uh, we already have in our strategic plan identified the areas with which we want to explore trade relationships. Subsequent to that, uh, we are now talking about a relationship with Edinburgh, and now talking about one with uh, the Middle East. If all of these things are up for negotiation and the strategic plan means nothing, then I'd like to submit a trade relationship with the south of France, preferably based in Saint-Tropez, and I know that Councillor Moran has expressed interest, as I would in such a post. But uh, to be serious, uh, the issue is that this council is becoming very focused on trade issues, and I'd suggest to the exclusion of the more important bread and butter issues. And I'd say also that it does concern me that uh, in establishing a, 
or seeking to inquire into establishing some kind of a relationship uh, with the Middle East, there are more problems there than dealing with China. And I'm sure that uh, the elected body is aware that there are enormous diplomatic problems with one of the countries that's proposed we deal with, Qatar. It's been isolated diplomatically by most every other country in the Middle East. And even in Adelaide, the last travel advice I read suggested that Qatar Airlines uh, would accept bookings until Christmas, but there was some uncertainty about whether it would be able to continue to fly because of the restrictions imposed on the airline. Now, uh, added to that, there is the strong belief in parts of the Middle East that Qatar is involved in uh, funding terrorism, and that's what this dispute is about. That is, that uh, according to the BBC, it reportedly paid ransom as much as $1 billion to a former Al-Qaeda uh, affiliate in Syria and to Iranian security officials as part of a deal that resulted in a ransom uh, for the release of 26 royal family members kidnapped by Iranian-backed Shia militiamen and dozens of Shia fighters. Now look, do we really want to get involved in this sort of stuff? We have substantial relationships already. Can we not just explore those and limit our reach to those which are in our strategic plan? I emphasize again, it is nothing personal. I think uh, Councillor Aviad has done a, a wonderful job on this trade mission, but this contemplation of yet another relationship with a part of the world where there is great instability seems to me to be biting off more than we need to. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Antic, members, if I can just remind you to speak either for or against the recommendation or the motion as it stands. We will vote on this in two parts. We will vote on part one, followed by part two. Councillor Antic. Um, yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I have to say I, I echo those concerns. Um, I, I, I mean, I, once again, I, I have no doubt that it was a, um, a very instructive and informative mission, but I have to say I once again um, do question um, the, uh, the merits of this council uh, flying in the face of its own carbon neutral targets when we're flying all around the world uh, doing this, that and the other. We are striving, of course, Lord Mayor, to save the planet uh, one day at a time. From, uh, from the city of Adelaide, stop the uh, imminent heating of the globe um, through uh, all various measures, uh, except it seems through international travel, which is uh, off limits. So um, look, solving Middle East peace uh, is probably not on the agenda for this council as well. I don't see that in one of our four points. Uh, I, I, I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a world where local governments dip their toes into federal issues, then sure, why, why not? But this is, in my view, not a, not a good use of <coughs> ratepayers' funds. Uh, and so I, I'd be happy to, uh, as Councillor uh, Martin has suggested, uh, simply note the um, note the, the uh, trade mission and uh, and leave it at that. So uh, I'd, I'd probably be uh, supporting number one and not number two. Thank you, Councillor Members. I will remind you that this was uh, ostensibly a trade mission, and uh, the members voted on this uh, some months ago to send Councillor Aviard on what is ostensibly a trade mission. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, I will vote against part two as well, um, although I can understand that that's not committing us to anything now, but uh, my feeling is that I don't want to commit to it in the future anyway, so why set the hairs, or whatever the expression is, running and wasting our administration's time? I expect this will get up because nobody likes to sound as though we're worried about uh, the Arab countries, but Qatar is one that um, I'm just reading in the updated news now big scandal on the, 19, uh, the 2022 World Cup. Qatar has done something wrong there too. So probably that's a country to keep away from. But um, I commend um, Hussam. I would be voting against this if it was um, anywhere really, because I think this council goes... I would um, vote against all of them, Sue, because I think that um, sister cities and trade missions are things that state governments and federal governments should do. We can accompany them as we sometimes do and I see no problem with that. But us, our, us striking out alone seems, always has seemed in my 20 years to be fruitless and ridiculous. Uh, support the big guys, but don't be big, try to be big guys ourselves. David Pemberthy in the Advertiser of Sunday Mail wrote a very good article about how it seems that the, um, the little issues we are too boring or too difficult to solve, and so we go off and try to solve world issues. I'm not saying this is what Hassam's motion is doing, but I think we really need to focus on what we need to focus on, and that's 
uh, from road, which remains unchanged from the election. We're still pouring people out into a dangerous situation. I saw a girl get knocked off a bike today. And I just think it's ridiculous to be sending people uh, around the world to set trade missions up that the state government can perfectly well do by itself. So let's nip this at the bar. Members, for the record, I do understand this was a state government-led trade mission and Councillor Aviado, or a member of council, was invited to join the state. So, Councillor Malati. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, <coughs> it's interesting. I had this conversation just with um, administration today. Um, certainly, we need to prioritise and, and because we don't have all, all resources for everything. But I think we get bogged down sometimes in understanding what um, or we, we overly <clears throat> define international relationships just about um, that business to business trade. And that's not what these interrelationship, um, international relationships and city relationships are about. There's so much more than that. We want to deliver our strategic goals and objectives. And we do that by learning and sharing knowledge with other cities. That's what this is all about. It's about creating city to city conversations and, and relationships. And I think that um, when we look at these missions and, and um, initiatives, we should have action plans to them because that's how we actually create something tangible for us to measure success by and outcomes by that deliver on our own strategic objectives. So if we start looking at that, that's why I'm open to having a look what this action plan could be. I'm sure it'll come back to us as part of the process. And we can say, well, this is a priority and this isn't. And that's the time that we have that conversation um, and we should have action plans for all of the um, global um, city relationship initiatives that we're doing, because that holds us, that does hold us to account. Um, so I urge, I, I, you know, thank Councillor Abiad, and um, I do hope that we have a look at an action plan to see what the opportunity tangibly actually may be. And I, and I support that for all the cities that we work with. Thank you, Councillor Malani. Members, any further debate? Councillor Abiyad, sum up. Yeah, of course, Lord Mayor. I'm not going to enter into a debate about Middle Eastern politics. One, I left the region a very long time ago um, because of many of those issues that many of us have experienced. Uh, but nevertheless, people-to-people -people communications and discussion remain the same. Uh, governments come and go, uh, and it's really important to note that we need to have a chat with people on the ground. And the reason I say this, and I'm not selectively picking one country over another, not siding with one country over another, uh, there is a federal focus at the moment to linking better ties with the Middle East. So obviously with us as a council, having some alignment, some exploration is not something we should shy away from. Uh, also, it's important to note that the Abu Dhabi trading group came to South Australia, to Adelaide, and visited us in the city. This is a group that's worth billions in investments that are looking at opportunities to invest in our community and vice versa. So the one thing I need to note to members, business always finds a way to do business in the region. They always will. Whether the political will is there or not, business will always find a way. The most important thing that governments can do is provide confidence. This is what governments can do for business. In the case of Iran specifically, there is no sanctions now. There is nothing imposed on Iran. However, business is not comfortable in conducting any comments with Iran because there isn't any confidence. And the role of government through delegation, through constant linkages, through cultural linkages, is to create that cultural connection that provides confidence for the business community to invest more. Now, do we have a role to play? Probably a very minor, small role to play. But it's nevertheless a very important role. Let's not forget, not very long ago, Adelaide was completely cut off from the region. We didn't have Emirates flying in here. We didn't have Qatar flying in here. And those linkages are very important for us as a city and as a state. So in making sure we keep those linkages alive, we need to keep a relationship active in one capacity or another. Could be through a phone call every now and again, could be through an email, or could be with something a bit more substantial, depending on the level of trade or cultural commitments we want to have with the region. I mean, imagine that in Egypt, more than 60% of their beans, which is full, that they eat on the street, was supplied by Australian. Imagine their local cuisine. Imagine the influence we have on those communities. The next level of community engagement, the next war we're going to see is a war of food, a war of climate. It's not going to be a geographic war. Imagine I can connect through social media, Lord Mayor, without a visa, 
with anyone within Iran, anyone in Saudi, anyone, Skype with them, trade with them, sell, have a chat, have a laugh, or even have a debate. But the minute you need to cross over, you need politics to tell you whether you can enter the country or not. The world is changing, it's becoming disruptive, and we need to be proactive. I'm not saying we invest hundreds of thousands, I'm not saying we invest a thousand. All I'm saying is we should have a dollar, and that's really important. Thank you, Lutman. Thank you, Councillor Aviat. Members will take this in part, so I now ask you to vote on part one. Those in favour? Those against? Part one is carried. Members, I now put part two before you. Those in favour? Those against? Councillor Antic, you're voting? So part two is carried. Those members voting in favour of part two of the motion, please rise. Councillor Malani, Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Abiad, the Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Slammer, Councillor Corbell, Councillor Clarahan, and Councillor Bashaud. Declared in favour. Members, I'd now take you to item 12.2, which is in the Maiden and Adelaide business mission to Edinburgh, August 2017, page 39 of your papers. Members, I will do this in two parts. I will first look to the recommendation you have before you, which we will take as a procedural motion. Councillor Milani moved. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Clarahan. Councillor Milani, any debate on the procedural? Okay. Councillor Clarahan. Members, any debate on the first part? Because the second part, members, I'll then seek nominations. No debate. So, Councillor Mulaney, you're summing up? Summed up. Thank you, Councillor Mulaney. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, members. Now, members, I now seek nominees. Councillor Mulaney? Lord Mayor, I nominate Councillor Vershaw. Councillor Vershaw, do you accept if nominated? I do, thank you, Lord Mayor. Members, do I have any further nominations? I don't. Councillor Vershaw. Sorry, Councillor Antic. Uh, Lord Mayor, I'd like to move an amendment. No, you can't, Councillor, because I'm now doing nominations. You could have moved an amendment on the first part. That's why I looked to the floor. There's nothing to amend at this point in time. Second, yeah, second part. No, no, we moved we moved both members. No. I, I I went to the floor, I looked at the mover, the seconder, I asked if there's any debate. I think we'll do that order that presupposes that um council approving anyone. Uh, which is uh, which is the well it wasn't my I didn't understand. I didn't understand. Well, members, there was nothing unprecedented here because this is the way we procedurally do these every single time. I would look to the recommendation. I would ask you to debate or talk to the recommendation. You do, you vote, and then we'd call for nomination. So procedurally, Councillor, that's how we would always do it. Do you have a question, Councillor? I'm going to assist Councillor Anzig. I think he, he can speak against it and flag that if he if this fails, that he has another motion. <laughs> Well, what I can do, Councillor Antic, or members, um, is that we've got one nominee, the nomination's been accepted. I now need to, for Councillor Vershaw to leave the chamber. Then I would need someone to move a motion to adopt uh, that, or adopt Councillor Vershaw as a successful nominee. You could debate it then. Yes, we could do that. No, I can't move an amendment then. Okay, we'll just wait, until, we'll just wait Councillor Antic. Yeah. Okay, now what I first need is, okay, so we have one nominee, the nominee is accepted. I now need a member to move a motion to endorse Councillor Vershaw to attend the trip, and then I need a seconder, and you can debate and you can amend. Okay, so I need a mover, members. Councillor Clarahan is moved. Can I have a seconder? Deputy Lord Mayor. Now, Councillor Antic. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, my mistake. Councillor Clareham, would you wish to debate? I reserve my right. Okay. Deputy Lord Mayor, do you wish to debate at this point in time? Reserving your rights. I've got two reserves, and now Councillor Antic, the floor is yours. No, I move to delete point two. No, you can't. Well, 
Well, well, Mayor, perhaps if I can just speak to that. You can speak to I, 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 well, once again, I, I reiterate my original comments in relation to further examples of overseas travel. Um, it's some concern, Lord Mayor. I think, to a certain extent, what, what, what I think we're seeing here is the state government offsetting its obligations to, uh, to travel. Uh, and if the minister um, thinks this is such an important uh, issue, then the minister perhaps in an election year might see fit to use state taxpayers' money rather than our ratepayers' money for this trip. I, I don't see it as being a critical issue for um, for local government, and I, and I certainly am not comfortable with endorsing anyone because I'm sure uh, the deputy, the incumbent deputy lord, deputy lord mayor elect, would be a very good choice for uh, for this mission. But I, I just I have a fundamental problem with us being involved in this in the first place. So. But it looks as though procedurally we um, the ship has sailed. So thank you, Councillor Antic. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes. Look, obviously, if we had to pick somebody, um, Councillor Gershaw would be far and above the first of the scene because of her past life as a festival organizer. She is no longer. That. So there's nothing for her to organise or any information she needs to bring back because all we do for the festivals is lease the land and give them a cheque. We have nothing to do with the organisation of it. Now if this trip was a made, what is it, made in Adelaide trip and the Lord may have signed something or his um, representative had to sign something, sure, send somebody. But this is purely to go and have at the festivals. Now you'll all say, and this will get up of course because they always get up, that, oh, you don't understand, it's not just about business. I think Natasha said it's all about relationships and everything. Councillor Fisher's just been to Edinburgh. I'm sure she's got some pretty good relationships. But as I said, this is not about her. I foreshadow that if this fails, I move a motion that we send no representative to and we wait until the um, friendly city um, documents need to be signed and we send our Lord Mayor there. But I see absolutely no point in sending somebody um, with the rationale that um, that's the best person, she's been a lot, she used to organise festivals. We're not a festival organiser. We need Councillor Vershaw, he's been here for a nanosecond, to stay here and use her talents, and all of you too, including the Lord Mayor, to use the talents to pick up, to fix the, the still quite some insurmountable problems, well, in this term so far, as I said before about going off to um, Saudi Arabia. We can't, we, we still haven't moved one tiny stone on Front Road. We've been here, to, we're over halfway our term, and we still haven't done that. And yet we've been to Edinburgh, we've been to Arabia, we've been everywhere. We've, we've fixed all the international problems there. We have not fixed, or Qatar, or wherever we've been. We have not, we've got some like, pictures with important looking people, and Sue's going off somewhere soon, I, I don't know where. But um, we haven't fixed Frome Road. Well, I, I, you can all go to San Tropez if you fix Frome Road the next two weeks, but you haven't done that. So I say you all sit here and do what you promised your ratepayers to do before you swan off overseas again. If we have to pick somebody, pick Sandy, but I say pick no one. So I'm going to vote against Sandy Virtual, even though I think she's the best person to vote, because we shouldn't be sending anybody. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Members, any further debate? Councillor Farahan. So, DLM, you reserved your right. Do you wish to speak before I go back? We to often you? hear. Thank you, Lord Mayor. No. We often hear about people comparing Adelaide to um, to Edinburgh because of our fantastic fringe shows, uh, our fringe festival. Um, we are seen as not necessarily just the Athens of the South in Riyadh food, but we're seen as the place in the Southern Hemisphere that is similar to Edinburgh in the North. Edinburgh is a city. It's not a state, it is a city. And I think it's quite appropriate that we have a representative from our city to go to the city of Edinburgh. There is still a lot we can learn. We don't need to stay still in relation to our festivals and the way we do things. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for us to go there and work with Edinburgh to look at opportunities for us to further develop our own reputation as a festival state. 
I mean, I got criticised because I'm a vice president of the LGA and I went to a national congress in Canberra with 800 local government delegates. I was told I was a, a thought I was a state politician or a federal politician. I mean, give us a break. If we stand still, stuck or mired here, without looking outwards, where is our future? That is a scary thought. I totally support this, and I could think of no one else who would be a better representative uh, of our city as Councillor Vershaw, soon to be our Deputy Lord Mayor, which is another great mantle to take there to Edinburgh. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Members, I put this before you for the vote. Those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. Thank you, members. If we could please invite Councillor Vershaw back into the chamber and we will resume. Welcome back, Councillor. Members, item 12.3, I've got a move with uh, Councillor Abiyad. <coughs> Do I have a second with Councillor Maloney? Councillor Abiyad, do you wish to speak to the matter? Yes, just briefly, Lord Mayor. Look, I, um, I remember moving um, this motion in the last term of last council and then again at this council. Uh, and it's taken us quite some time to really get this right, but I really want to take the opportunity to thank administration for their work. Um, also with the state government really to be able to achieve this specific outcome. I think Pill Street is a very important up and coming street for us. There's been a lot of activation there and a lot of businesses that are sort of trialling. Um, and I think we've gone a lot of those aspects right. Lighting, I remember, was a challenge. We've managed to work through that. Greening, organising the outdoor dining sort of set up in the area. And obviously the one, of, one of the most important things is really liaising with those businesses uh, that initially resisted the change and initially were not sure to take whether they want to take this on board or not. Uh, but I would imagine that our administration has spent significant amount of time making sure to get the support and endorsement of those businesses to be able to uh, achieve this outcome. Um, I look forward to providing more pedestrianised zones around our city, especially with streets like this. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to this magical journey that's taking place in that area. I think the West End is really up and coming. Uh, and I would like to, on public record, note obviously my thanks to the administration uh, for all the hard work they've done, uh, but also that we shouldn't um, shy away from looking on Highland Street Actual. That place does need some significant amount of work that we need to invest in over the next few years. We have neglected it for a long time. And I think it's important, given the rejuvenation of all those areas, that we look at that uh, in, the short, um, in the short term over the next year or two to make sure we get some positive results on those areas as well. But I'd ask members to support this. Thank you, Councillor Aviad. Councillor Milani, you seconded? Just to echo those uh, words, Lord Mayor, from Councillor Aviad. Thank you, Councillor. Members, any debate? Councillor Clearhand. Um, just a question, Lord Mayor. I was wondering, um, are there any residences in that street that would be impacted by this closure? And have they been individual have they been consulted? I'll refer that to the CEO. I understand there is one residential building in that street, but I don't think it has car parks. CEO? Beth Thodeson Park, thanks. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my understanding is that there's actually no residential in that street. Uh, there is actually. There's one. 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 It was converted into residential, but I understand none of them have car parks, so they wouldn't be affected. Yeah. Members, any further questions, queries, or debate? Councillor Wilkinson. Um, the cost of the road closure is $190,000. How much are each of the pop up bollards? CEO? Sure, thanks. 
through the chair, we're still investigating the cost of um, automatic pop-up bollards as a result of the road closure. Uh, at the moment, they're between um, $8,000 to $15,000 each, depending on the actual bollard that's installed and how we operate, how we operate them. How many bollards are we putting in? At the moment, we'd be looking at putting three at either end. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> members, no further debate. I'll hand you back to the mover, Councillor Abia. Summed up. Members, I put this before you. Those in favour? Those against? We carry the item, which is item 12.3, which takes us on to item 12.4, members. You have a recommendation to approve and note regarding Category 2 developments. I've got a mover with Councillor Abia and a seconder with Councillor Wilkinson. So I need to go to the mover first. So, Councillor Abiyad. You've got a second. Well, Councillor Wilkinson, are you operating a second or do you want to wait to amend? Okay, so I'll go with the second or Councillor Slama. Councillor Abiyad, would you wish to speak to it? Councillor Slama, do you wish to speak to this matter? Councillor Wilkinson. Um, I'd like to move an amendment that we um, maintain the status quo uh, practice until the introduction of the um, uh, new planning act. And um, I, um, uh, when I was first elected in 2007, okay, we'll just, so, can you just check your screen, Councillor, to confirm whether the wording is uh, playing out to your satisfaction? Yes. It does now. I'll seek a seconder for the purposes of the debate. Can I have a seconder for Councillor Wilkinson, please, members? Councillor Martin. Thank you. So, Councillor Wilkinson, the floor is now yours to debate your amendment. Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, the Deputy Lord Mayor has just suggested alternative wording, that after 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the words, once the new planning legislation comes into effect and the opportunity for on-site signage becomes available. Okay, so your seconder was Councillor Martin, so that's been a slight change in what was initially put forward. You're comfortable with that as a seconder? And so the original uh, line at the bottom we can then remove, I presume. Now, Councillor Wilkinson, that's what we're debating, that's your amendment? And I presume in doing so you're then seeking... Uh, notification signage, that's clear on site notification signage. So the balance of the motion will remain as stands. That's correct. Okay, now we'll start the clock. You can debate. Thank you. Um, when I was first elected um, in 2007, this was one of the very first motions that I did um, because the council at that time had changed its practice of uh, letting the community know about developments happening in this area through the local uh, messenger. Uh, the newspaper and a lot of people and it was sort of argued that the thing available would be done <coughs> and stuff like that. But not everybody is computer literate and also it's about the information being convenient and available to people with a messenger that gets delivered to their house or their business or is in cafes and things. So when they're there they can just check out what's happening in the area. And it's all about really keeping a community informed and, and uh, as to what's happening in their area because people are interested in what's happening in their area and not everybody's going to be going to the council website and literally checking, going online, checking you know, every week to see if there's something happening in their area. Um, it's all about making um, our uh, processes open and accessible to the community and keeping the community in the loop rather than out of the loop. And through recent changes to the planning system, the community have certainly pushed out of the planning loop to a big degree. And this is one way that we can at least 
um, uh, whilst we're still able to until the new legislation changes, um, able to do that. And there is an opportunity for people to see that and to make comments, and they're allowed to legally to make um, um, uh, submissions when, when they see uh, see that uh, thing, and it would, would be diminishing the uh, the consultation that we do. Uh, and, uh, and I think if the new legislation, when it comes in, um, uh, uh, enables site signage, that's a really good move. And, uh, and then I think uh, you could sort of supersede this when, when that alternate thing comes in, because uh, if some development's happening uh, in your street, you, you want to know about it, and you know about it because the site sign, because you see the site sign on the uh, on the development side, which is lots what lots of other cities and things do. Um, the current legislation we can't do it, so at least we can continue this practice, which we're allowed to do, to help for the community. So I urge you to support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Martin, you seconded. Do you wish to speak to the matter? Yeah, just very briefly, Lord Mayor, to say that uh, I endorse Councillor Wilkinson's comments. It is a very sensible measure, pending the change that will allow signage on sites. Uh, that will be a vast improvement indeed over the current system, which requires for uh, uh, newspaper advertisements. Uh, having said that, in the interim, it is important for us to continue this practice to ensure that everybody is aware of developments where they have the capacity to provide comment. And I am aware of circumstances where people claim not to have received the advice. An advertisement serves uh, to uh, bring it to the attention of neighbours and others who might raise it with them. And the cost is uh, relatively minor, I'm assuming, until the new planning legislation uh, comes into force. Uh, and therefore, uh, I would suggest to members it's a reasonable measure to support this. Members, any further debate on the proposed amendment you have before you? Councillor Clarehan? I think this is a really good out, uh, amendment. It really worries me that with the new Act that residents, neighbours, communities have become incredibly disempowered and will be well, will become incredibly disempowered um, through abilities to actually have any say at all in what's going on in their local communities. And they won't know for a lot, in a lot of cases until something is either knocked down or starts to pop up. Um, we're told that our role is at the policy level, that our role is to consult with communities to, so that we get the policies right at the top end but we've found from experience that that just doesn't work. Uh, and so we're further disempowered. And I think that once the Act comes in, once we're no longer able to advertise and inform our communities what's going on in their neck of the woods, we need to undertake a communication education strategy. Because at the end of the day, council will always be blamed for things that happen in their neighbourhood that people have had no warning about. And I think they need, we need to make sure that we have a communication strategy that explains to members of the public that this is uh, not of our making and that they have um, lost the ability to um, comment on developments through the new Act, not through any, any action by this council. Now, members, any further debates? There isn't. So before I hand you back to the mover of the proposed amendment, Councillor Wilkinson, I just might, just to make sure that we've got a fully informed debate before us, members, I, I, I note, and for the benefit of those that are not uh, involved in DAP or other matters, that the differences between Category 1, Category 2 and Category 3 with regards to our obligation as a council to effectively uh, advertise those applications. Can I just seek some clarity from administration for the purposes of this debate, please, members. Uh, Rebecca, thanks. Through the presiding member, Category 1 application is one where there is no notification to any adjoining owners and you cannot notify that application and you cannot accept any representation from any interested parties, even if they haven't been notified. Category 2 is whereby you notify the adjoining owners and or the ones directly behind um, or across the road. Um, and they are given a letter, by the way, of uh, notice in the, in the, um, through the mail. Um, and then category three is the same as category two, but you must put an app, a, a notice in the paper and you must receive all the representations that have been received. 
approval of the representors. So can I just seek clarity that the for the purposes of a category two, those uh, immediately impacted, so to speak, uh, residents or uh, commercial ratepayers within a certain proximity to the said site, they are automatically advised anyway. So the advertising is for a wider radius. Is that our understanding? Okay, so members, you're clear on the processes involved. Those on DAP, of course, would be. Um, members, I hand you back to council. We don't go to the Deputy Lord Mayor first. Um, I just want to check then, Lord Mayor, whether the administration is happy with what's proposed and whether that, uh, I mean, what this is doing is we're still revoking. So we're not having to put in um, anything in the messenger that um, meets any legislative requirement. I think things that we can still, we can, we, we can still advertise in the messenger, but not necessarily in the format that we advertise now. Um, that we're going to continue to advertise and place notices in the messenger until the legislation changes and we can do site stuff. The only thing that I'm worried about is whether the paragraph 1.2 actually still works in that context and can we get a bit of advice about that or whether that needs to be. Uh, uh, do you understand what our intent is, which is to make sure that communities know what's happening within their community, um, but not to not to give them false information about their right, you know, not to give them a false expectation about their right, what their right are. Through the presiding member, I think it would be wise to make it clear in the advertisement that if you haven't been directly notified, then um, then you don't have the right to lodge a representation. So does and the recommendation, as it currently stands, give you enough leeway to do that? Because it feels to me like it does, but I just want to check that you've got that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, DLM. So, Councillor Wilkinson, sum up from the proposal. Oh, Councillor Raviard, you speaking to the amendment? Uh, yeah, just quickly, uh, Lord Mayor, just to clarify, with Category 2, obviously, there's direct uh, communication with the affected, um, uh, I guess, constituents as a result of the application. Um, and with C Councillor Wilkinson's amendments, we're basically still going to advertise for two and three, where with the current standing amendment prior to that, the, the original recommendation, we only um, advertise for three. We'll remain, we'll continue to advertise for category three in the messenger, is that correct? Through the presiding member, we have to do well, category three, but we currently do it for, for two, and two, two and three. Yes. Yeah. Look, I'll speak against this. Um, I mean, just having gone through some of those experiences myself in a separate location, is it does create a sense of confusion for category two applicant for category two developments, uh, where if it's in the paper, it does give an opportunity or a perceived opportunity for people to respond or write to council in relation to that application, but then they'll be disappointed or knocked back for not having the ability to represent. Uh, at a meeting to put forth their concerns uh, and that's the issue. I think that's misleading in the sense of democracy. We have no choice but in Category 3 as per law and per act that we must notify using the messenger and that provides an opportunity that's very clear for individuals to be able to respond and write to council and also potentially represent at those meetings to be able to um, convince one way or another or get a, a better outcome for that specific development. Um, so look, I think um, going with the original recommendations, although I understand Councillor Wilkinson's um, intent is less confusing, it streamlines the opportunity, uh, and it's really important, members. I mean, the reason I sort of my ear pricked up when Councillor Wilkinson mentioned this before is I wouldn't want to leave any constituent left out. But in the Category Two opportunity, every single affected constituent will receive the letter from Council uh, asking them um, to represent on this specific development for category two, for neighbouring uh, affected uh, applications. So, uh, look, I would ask that we move away from uh, more, more red tape, uh, because this process specifically, not only costly for council, but it's also costly for the applicants, uh, especially when potentially the people we're trying to reach out to are not directly impacted and they have no case to respond to a category two, uh, or a matter of fact, that can only be done in the category three. And if we're gonna be advertising for category three anyway, and we have to continue to do that, I think it's best that we emit the Category 2 notification through the messenger and do that through direct mail as we currently do now. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad. Now, Deputy Lord Mayor, you asked a question um, before, so you can debate. Okay, so I would like to speak in favour of the amendment. If I could just um, summarise where I think the amendment gets us. Um, and again, if the administration, that was the purpose of my question before, if the administration think I've got it wrong, then please shout. As I understand it, a Category 2 at the moment you have to um, 
letterbox or, or contact directly anybody within a 60 metre um, zone. Brady. Category two. So can I get clarity on that? It's it's not within 60 metres of the site, it's in accordance with the definition of adjacent okay, in the Act, so, so, but you're roughly okay. there. Yeah. Okay, so, it, so the adjacent owners have to be notified uh, directly and they do have a right to be heard. Uh, what we've been doing is also notifying in the messenger um, for anybody and we've been giving them a slightly false impression that they also have a right to be heard um, and we want to put a stop to that. Uh, but what we do want to do is make sure that people know what's going on in their neighbourhood. And so my intent, and I, th I, and I thought that's what we got to in this case, was that we still notify our adjacent, adjoining, adjacent owners, but we put a notice in the messenger that no longer says you have a right, but simply, do you know that this is going on in your street? And we do that until the new Act legislation enables us to put a sign up instead. And the reason I support that is because I want to know what's going on in my street, whether I make an application or whether I have, I have my two box worth about it uh, before a, um, a, a government entity uh, or not. I simply want to know what is going on in my street. It will make, maybe I make a decision about whether I want to sell my house as a consequence of it or whether I want to you know, put a tenant in and move to the suburbs or whether I want to paint my house blue. It might, there might be all sorts of things that I want to decide as a consequence of a, a major, particularly a major development happening close to me. Bear in mind, if you're not an adjo adjoining owner, and let's say 60, the 60, you know, whatever it is, meters, it's, it's pretty close. You can be very close to a building and not know that anything is going on because no, there's no method of notification. Now, for me, the messenger is not a great me method of notification. I never look at the messenger. And I think increasingly people are not going to the, uh, are not going to papers as much. Um, so for me, the on-site signage is a much better mechanism um, but in the short term, we're not entitled to do that by legislation. We're not able to put the on-site uh, signage up. So the messenger is the next best thing, and I think we should be taking that opportunity. So I'm hoping that what this means is there'll be something in the paper that says, here are the categories, here's the one that you are entitled to have a comment about, and here's another set of things that are happening in your district, and you're not entitled necessarily to comment about it but we are informing you that it exists. I think that's something the council can do without much sweat, and I support it. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. So I'll go to Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Moran to debate the amendment. Sorry, right, Lord Mayor, I had a question and that's been covered. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Moran. Look, I'm just briefly going to reiterate exactly what, <laughs> what Megan said, because she's spot on. Um, it is, a, a, the word adjacent has uh, takes some people by surprise. Like if you're in the back corner, you're not considered adjacent. So that properties that see themselves as neighbouring are not considered adjacent. And one of the things, as the administration know, that we most get yelled at for is, I had no idea. Nobody asked me, I don't know what happened. Now, all it has to be, there must be, a, in big lettering that's, that's obvious, only if you've received um, notification directly via post, have you the ability to go then officially respond. Um, and this notification is for your information. Um, and I'd like to get it if there was something unusual in my street, and I think that's something we do. And the new laws, just to take um, Hassan's point, the new laws actually are better than that. The new laws allow you to put a sign in the thing so everybody that drives past, everybody in the whole suburb can see it. So that, that's a really good step. This is not such a good good way to do it, and it's proven because lots of people don't read the messenger and don't see it there, unfortunately. But until we get the, the Rolls-Royce one, where they've got whack and great sign that everybody can read, let's stick with the slightly not so good one. And also, often the neighbours that have been, um, especially in the city when there's a lot of rental and da da da, don't don't know that they don't get it. So that it's, then their neighbour says, "Hey, did you get something in here? And this is what we want to, you know." we'll all object. So the more people that know about it, the better, but we must make make it very clear who's allowed officially, because we used to let anybody, in category two, I used to go and let, before we weren't allowed to speak to our ratepayers and planning matters, I used to go and photocopy the um, the letter and just door knock with it. And we get hundreds of people doing it. We let them, let them do it, but now it's got a lot stricter, so you know it's not, not in our 
and we have to change that. But until the better system comes, let not, let's not go to a worse system. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Now, Councillor Wilkinson, to sum up on the proposed amendment. I just have a question of the administration. Could I had asked for some clarity on this question about the, um, uh, um, the legal position in terms of uh, if someone sees the notice, you know, what, what their entitlements are. And, and my understanding from the conversation was that uh, someone who sees that is able to write a submission. They might not be able to speak for a meeting, but they are able to make a submission. And when I was previously on the JAP, we would get submissions from people who weren't the immediate the abutting. And the thing is the adjacency thing is literally... Councillor, can I encourage you to bring that to a question yes. and then you can do your concluding uh, arguments. Clarity on that question. <laughs> someone, who read, someone who reads the, the notice in the messenger... You're not allowed to in well, okay. Through the presiding member, it doesn't say that you can't let them. The legal advice was that you shouldn't let them because it's misleading. Mm -hmm. Are we still here? No. Can we get them now? Yeah. Okay, so does that satisfy your question, Councillor? So on. Uh, only with the leave of the person no, summing up, Councillor. Yeah, that will be the leave for that question. Um, Lord Mayor, there was some discussion about the possibility of having an information session so that people did understand what the implications of the new Act is. And um, I'm just wondering whether that needs to be covered off in the motion or whether, in fact, we can pick that up once the new Act is um, in place. We'll take that as a question, and then we will soon well, be debating. Whether it needed to well, be we'll soon be debating a substantive motion. Okay. There might be an opportunity for you. So, um, Claire, could you please answer Councillor Clarehan's question? Then, Councillor Wilkinson, I'll ask you to sum up on your debate for your amendment. Through the presiding member, um, as and when pieces of the PDI Act come into effect, it's really important, as councils indicated, that the community understands what it means for them. Um, so we are planning a comprehensive engagement program over the next six to 12 months. And as and when we know more, we understand what the implications are, we will be sharing that with the community through a variety of different ways. So it's got to be part of the... We, we've already got that work planned. Okay. Okay. Now, Councillor Wilkinson, to sum up on the proposed amendment, members that you have before you on your screen. Yeah. So my understanding uh, is that there is no legal impediment to people putting in a written submission if they so choose to do so. But um, uh, this is basically uh, maintaining our current practice until the new legislation comes through. Um, so we're we're not alienating our community. And if you think think of a street you live in, and there's a development that sort of two doors down across the other side of the road, of course you care what's happening in your street, and and uh, and, uh, and it's reasonable that um, you should be uh, able, given the opportunity to to know about that and, and put in some comment because planning issues are not just about overshadowing and overlooking. People care about the look of a building that's been built in their street or the demolition of a building that's been demolished in their street. People care about that. People don't stop caring when they're no longer just an immediately adjacent um, property owner. That's the whole intent behind this, to be fair to, to the community. Um, so uh, I hope I have your support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. So members, you have a proposed amendment before you. Those in favour? Those against, so we carry the uh, amendment, which now means we have an amended amended substantive motion. Do I have any further debate before I hand you back to the mover? I've got Councillor Clarehan. Lord Mayor, just one um, comment that wasn't covered previously. Given um, the nature of our city and the density of our city, um, it's quite often that people may not be adjacent, but they are actually five metres away and a future development can have a huge impact on someone who's only five or six metres away. And in particular, if they share a, a very narrow laneway. And I think that you know the current law or the proposed law is not going to address that issue. It's going to, it's going to exclude people from commenting on potentially huge impacts. 
to their daily life. So I think it really is important um, that uh, where possible, um, people are aware of what's going on on their doorstep virtually. Thank you, Councillor. We'll take that as a comment for the debate. Thank you. Members, any further? I'll hand you back to Councillor Abiyad, who is the mover of the substantive motion. Councillor Claude Mounts, I want to thank Councillor Wilkinson for bringing a different perspective into it. Um, I think one of the things we can consider in the future as a digital council, having the ability to have email addresses for every rate payer, may, means we don't have to advise on the messenger that no one potentially reads or may read, and that way we could notify people directly through email. So maybe that's something we could look at in a future that has zero costs um, in advertising for this administration. And thank you, Councillor Wilkinson, for bringing another parallel to the debate. Thank you, Councillor Abiyat. So, members, you have a substantive motion before you as amended. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, members. Item 12.4, which takes us on to item 12.5, seeking a variation of an encroachment policy, Councillor Abiyat. Seconded by members. Councillor Maloney, Councillor Abiyad, you wish to speak to item 12.5? Councillor Maloney, you wish to speak to item 12.5? Members, any debate on item 12.5? Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, I've had a look at this um, proposal. I sent out a photograph of the site to, to members if they had a chance to see that um, earlier this evening. Um, the, um, uh, this is an unusual site where it falls within the Morford Street zone that allows a nine-storey building, but is immediately next door to a site where the height limit is like three or four storeys. It's only a nine metre wide site, and um, the development is short on car park. You know, it's, it's like it's got eight apartments, it's only got six car parks, and you have one per apartment. But also, it further doesn't doesn't comply with our um, already very lenient policy on, on balconies. I think the least it can do is um, um, comply with, with that. I don't think we should be um, um, bending council policy to sort of accommodate this development, which is really quite out of, out of kilter. But, but at least, um, I mean, if it was um, pulled back so the property balconies were within the boundary, uh, at least to the extent that our policy requires, um, you know, that would be uh, a, a better outcome. But, um, but I, don't, I just don't think we should be, um, uh, uh, no point having, you know, policy documents of this if we just um, uh, bend, bend it every time we're asked to. And uh, uh, so they would just have to reduce the floor of the building slightly to, uh, to accommodate the policy, which they knew was in place at the time they developed the site. Thank you, Councillor. Members, any further debate? Councillor Martin. Look, I, I want to go uh, uh, down that path as well, um, but a slight variation. Um, I, I have raised before the encroachment policy, which is still being uh, redesigned. Uh, it is a surprise to me that uh, we have commercial properties in the city who are paying uh, fees every year on the basis of the balconies on which their customers sit. Now. That is as it should be according to our policy. If you are the owner of a property and you have an encroachment and you are profiting from that encroachment, you should pay. Uh, and that is the same principle, by the way, that applies to the outdoor dining permits. That is to say, we say, if you are profiting from the use of public space, then you pay for that public land. You pay the city of Adelaide, the ratepayers. Now, these balconies on this structure are not being constructed for an altruistic purpose. This is not a hospital. This is not a recycling place. It's not going to be the site of a green wall or anything uh, for which, uh, or from which uh, a benefit flows to the community. They are apartments being sold for profit. Now, the developer is able to charge a price for the apartments based on the square footage of the apartments. And obviously, if you can put more balcony there and reduce the need to consume floor space in the apartment for the balcony, you have a bigger property. You make a bigger profit. Now, I fail to understand what the difference is between hospitality business having to pay an encroachment fee because people are sitting, eating and drinking on their balconies and making a profit. Outdoor dining operations are using public space 
and paying a fee for the profits that they make on the use of that public space. And yet we discriminate in the city and we say of developers, it's okay, we'll waive the encroachment policy, you don't have to pay anything, um, unlike those other ratepayers. Now it seems to me that we, we have a problem there, there is a large inconsistency. And therefore I will be voting against this on the basis that it is unfair to every other commercial ratepayer in the city who is paying an encroachment fee. It was only send you further hand. So before I send this matter back to the mover to sum up, Councillor Lani wishes to speak to it. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I um, uh, su support this, and I just wanted to ask a question. Well, when we um, waive encroachment um, uh, compliance, are we actually also waiving the fees? I've not understood that. That's not what I understand. No, that's a question. I don't think that's accurate. See you. We're waiving the policy, but not the fees. Is that correct? Yeah. Through the presiding member, that's correct, <laughs> noting that residential encroachments don't currently, under council policy, uh, attract a fee. So, um, so let's, let's just be you know, really clear about what we're talking about here. We're not waiving the fees. We, we just announced that we want to... Can I have clarity on that, please? I, I, on residential property. We're waiving the well, I think policy. That's what I'm making. Yes, members, for the purposes of the debate, there is no fee on residential encroachments. There is a fee on commercial encroachments, but we still require the policy to be waived for a residential encroachment. Right, so we'll, my point is you've mentioned we're not waiving fees. We're not doing that in this situation. So... Um, but, but we just announced that, um, bless you, whoever that was, um, we just announced that uh, we want to encourage uh, resident owner occupiers in the city, we want to encourage investment, we've been working with the um, state government on, on doing this, and so there are certain instances where to get a better design outcome, this, this is what we have to do. We are, um, I believe, when we look at the encroachment policy, um, we need to look at why we keep coming up with all of these instances where we have to wait. We have to actually look at what's working and what's not working. Um, so, you know, in this instance, I think that it's a better outcome and that we should waive the um, uh, encroachment policy. Members, I might, Councillor Clare, ahead. Can I ask a question of administration? I'm, I'm looking at page 59 and I'm noticing that it says city living zone where this building is located. And I just wondered what's the policy level, the policy regarding um, height for that city living zone? See you. Thanks. Through the presiding member, Councillor Clarahan, you've caught me out. I wasn't um, thinking I was coming to a DAP meeting, so I didn't bring my development plan, to be honest with you. But um, my understanding that this development is not over height in that particular zone. Oh, I just wondered, it had a 14 metre height limit written on there above the city li living zone, and I just sorry, wondered. Oh, sorry, uh, I, I, I misunderstood the question, yes. So the city living zone height is of the 14 metres, but the subject site has a much higher height limit and this... So it doesn't is... fall into that particular zone? That's correct. Okay, yes. thank you. I just didn't want us to be rewarding someone who was blatantly um, breaching the height limit for that area, given... Is that pre um, property next door heritage listed? Right, thank you. Members, I'll speak to this matter briefly, if I may, before I hand you back to the mover, Councillor Abiyad. Um, members, I just encourage everyone, if not caution everyone, to be mindful of policy on the run. Um, we, through, we will have a very deliberate debate about all of the various aspects of encroachments and fees associated with them, residential and commercial, and that piece of work is coming back to us, I understand, in August. Is that correct? That's correct. So. Um, up until that time, uh, we've had a custom of looking at these, I guess, on merit, um, but uh, notwithstanding, the, uh, a good re-look at this policy, of course, is warranted. 
So, but I just encourage you to think about um, uh, the, uh, the way that we've treated these decisions in the past and until which time we do look at the entire policy and all of its parts, um, just to consider that before you make your decision. Councillor Abiyat, to sum up, please. Sum up. Members, I put this before you. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, members. We carry item 12.5. Item 12.6, members, moved by Councillor Abiyad. Can I have a seconder, please, members? Councillor Milani. Councillor Abiyad, you should speak to item 12.5. 12.6, my mistake. Councillor Milani. Thank you. Members to the floor. Any comments, queries? Councillor Wilkinson. Um, the David Jones building in uh, London Mall was designed by um, renowned Adelaide architect Jack McConnell, and this building was actually considered for state heritage listing as an excellent example of contemporary architecture. Um, uh, just coming at it from an architectural perspective, uh, I think the proposals to, to this building are, are most unfortunate. If, if this building had been you know, state heritage listed as it was proposed to be, they wouldn't have been allowed to sort of bugger around with a building like, like that I perceive as being done to it. Uh, also, um, on the um, uh, uh, eastern end, wrapping around the corner, um, the proposal is to have a 250 mil thick encroachment over the public land with a large blank um, section that to me looks like it's going to be uh, set up as a medium for uh, massive signage thing. I mean, do we want London Mall um, to basically have at first and second level just signage? So you've got shop front and then signage, or do we actually want to have shop front to signage at canopy level and then actually nice building facades? You know, it's just a big blank. Um, thing that wraps around the corner, and I can see this step one in, in a two step thing to basically put um, signage at first floor level, which used to be category three non complying because um, the planners understood that that form of signage was very undesirable. You see some buildings uh, where they've got signage in front of the first floor windows. And if any of you have been through Southeast Asia, you see buildings where the signage just is all over the first and second floor of the buildings, it's sort of heading down that path. And uh, and I'm aware that there's a significant tenant about to go into this thing, but I mean, uh, when the Apple store came to Adelaide and it said, oh, I has to go in this particular format, that my, board, my uh, niece um, worked on the Apple store in Manhattan and they put the Apple store in Manhattan in the heritage building. They, they, they fitted to the building rather than insisting that the building be sort of, you know, Dodged around to to, uh, to suit a large signage platform or something like that. So um, uh, I uh, I won't be supporting this because I think it's going to spoil the building. And I think and a significant tenant would. It's a very it's a beautiful granite marble building. It's a magnificent building. Just have this cladding whacked over the top of that granite and marble. Um, um, uh, Jack McConnell building, I think, is most unfortunate, so I won't be supporting it. Uh. Members, I might just seek some clarification from our director with regards to the applicant's intent, with regards to that cladding, whether uh, just for the purposes of the debate, uh, with regards to the full extent of signage, their intention, Claire? Through the presiding member, you will see on page um, 71 what looks like indicative signage, but that isn't um, subject of, of this report. Thank you, members. Any further debate for the floor? Councillor Martin. Uh, look, I'd like to uh, support in part what Councillor Wilkinson is saying. Uh, and that is that there is an intention uh, with this encroachment for us to give the nod to an iconic building in Adelaide to be clad in a material that we know nothing about, but which is likely to be synthetic, likely to be brightly coloured, and lead to what, uh, in my view, is the irrevocable um, uh, change to the, uh, the appearance of the building. It is 
It is the integrity of the building at stake and the means by which this will happen is our approval of this encroachment. Now, the reason this is happening, as I understand it, is that the, uh, uh, the building owner has a major tenant and the tenant's occupancy is conditional on the building being refashioned in a style that suits it. And I must say, I find this incredibly galling that in cities all around the world, when major retailers go to them and say, we're coming to your city, they say, welcome. If a retailer says, we want to destroy your heritage or significant building in the process, um, it doesn't happen. Now, I've given members an example of such things. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson mentioned the Apple store in Manhattan. Here's the H&M store in Barcelona. It, it is in a heritage building, as it was. All that's changed is the H&M store. Look at Marks and Spencer. That's in Prague. It says Marks and Spencer on top of a heritage building. It is unaltered, unaffected. And yet, when retailers come to this city, there seems to be a view that it's okay for building owners to come along and say, well, look, we want to change the look of the, uh, the city. It's, it's an important thing for us to do. And if you don't do this, we may not come to the city. We may take our business to some other place or we'll just bypass Adelaide. Well, I don't believe that for a minute. And, and I think that this city needs to stand up and say, we're comfortable in our skin with our architectural heritage. We are not going to change it. And our, our role in this is to say, no, we will not approve an encroachment uh, that will lead to this planning. Now, if as a consequence of that, the owner of the building decides that uh, they're going to change the building in some other way, well, that's the subject of another process. But we are, by approving this, empowering changes to the architectural heritage of this city. And it's not on. We have to say at some stage, we are comfortable with our city. We welcome other organizations coming here, opening businesses, stimulating our economy. But there are ways of encouraging them that don't require the destruction of our architectural heritage. And we can offer incentives as a council. We've done that for departments. I see no reason for us to look for some other means of accommodating a new business. Thank you, Councillor Martin. We now have Deputy Lord Mayor followed by Councillor Moran. Can I start with a question, uh, Lord Mayor, to the administration just about signage. Uh, I'm assuming that if anybody did want to put any signage on this building, there was a separate ap application method for that. Could you just explain that? Through the presiding member, it depends upon what time they lodge the application. They may do it at the same time when the Development Assessment Commission is assessing the proposal, which is what's happening with this one in front of us now, or after the works are done, it would come into council for assessment. Um, okay, so I, I and so there is an opportunity if, if we don't like the way they sign it or they propose to sign it, there's an opportunity for someone to put a stop to that. Through the presiding member, depending upon when the when it is lodged, but yes, in effect. Uh, so, look, I, I'm going to support the um, the uh, encroachment variation or whatever the terminology is. Forgive me. Um, I, I actually I think this does this building a favour. Um, I what it seems to me that it does is it opens up the building so that it becomes a building that actually adds to the. Uh, uh, adds to what goes on in the mall rather than diminishes what goes on in the mall. At the moment that building is very closed off. I looked at it not knowing that it was, sorry, not knowing or understanding that it was you know, from a particular architect, I know it's not heritage listed, um, and that in any way it's never struck me as being um, particularly dramatic. Um, what I look at now is the, 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 um, the opening up of the upper stories, which will have views back down into the mall. That to me is what we've been trying to achieve. We've been trying to get second and uh, first and second stories actually activated, things happening up there, and giving life to the mall through that and allowing those people to, to see what's going on. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy with the changes. I, I take the councillor's point about signage. I'd be very disappointed if that turned out to be a great big ugly signage wall, but as I understand it from the administration, that's a separate issue and will be addressed separately. And I think we can, um, we can take some... Uh, 
feedback now about what our expectations might be about that. But I'm I'm keen that we get um, get that building actually active and, and, and fully used. And as I understand it, there's a, a major international retailer who's interested in using it. They're interested in using it and opening the building up and making it more uh, sort of visible to the to the mall users. Um, that's going to bring some vibrancy to that bit of the bit of the mall, and I think that's a, a, a great outcome for our city. So I've, I've got no problems with um, with the encroachment as it's, as it stands, and in fact I'm keen on it because I think it's going to make a significant difference. Members, no further debate. I may comment before I hand back to the mover. Sorry, Councillor Mayor, my apologies. The floor Thank is yours. You. Once again. Uh, Megan beat me to the post. Normally, of course, with heritage issues, I would completely go along with the... Uh, sorry, what? No, 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 I said once again, you've beaten me to it. Um, normally, I'd go um, with heritage matters with Sandy, but not with this one. Um, this is not a heritage building, uh, listed building. I remember when the interim listing was put up, I think by Kelly Henderson, if I'm not mistaken, back, back in the day. And I think it was really the artwork that was the centre of the concern over the heritage listing. Um, so it, it is a, quite an attractive building, there's no doubt, but it's not heritage. And I, I, we have a system of heritage listing in this state, whether you like it or not. What is listed is heritage, what isn't is up to the vagaries of the normal planning rules. Um, this, I assume, will be a little bit like Tiffany's in, um, that was clad um, in North Terrace. Did you mind that? Um, the signage will have to go to a separate authority, hopefully it will come to council. But I imagine, I, I assume that it was a bit of a secret that there's big business, but as that's been <laughs> blabbed all over the place tonight, I assume that it, a business of this statute is not going to plaster a, a hideous sign all over it at the detriment of the building and its business. But that, that is an argument for another day. Um, I am comfortable with my city, Councillor Martin. But I'm nervous of the donut effect, and I'm nervous of the city dying. It isn't now, but uh, any opportunity we can get to get a business of the ilk that you've shown us pictures of, Councillor Martin, I would bend over backwards. This isn't ruining this building, and it isn't pulling it down, and it isn't, it isn't destroying it. It is an underutilised building now, and any further, especially with a, with a big firm that would bring, bring money and um, upper activation, I applaud it. The photos that uh, Councillor Martin has shown us, of course we wouldn't clad those buildings. These are hundreds of year old iconic buildings. You wouldn't clad those. But David Jones, old David Jones is, is, is not that. Um, it is not um, an old classic building and it's not heritage listed. So I support this without any reservation. Members, I'll speak briefly to this matter. I also speak very enthusiastically in favour of this particular encroachment. Uh, Council does receive uh, encroachment fees, as you know, for commercial properties, but setting that aside, uh, the attraction of major retailers to the Rundle Mall precinct indeed is their competitive advantage, and it is one which they have been lacking, and this is an outstanding opportunity for the centre of our city, for our central retail district. Also, <laughs> by approving the encroachment, you will then enable the development. And the development opens the building up with more natural light, upper level activation. I understand it's going to create something in order of 200 jobs. We need jobs in South Australia, members. So on a retail level, on an economic development level, on a building which is not heritage listed, which I personally agree, uh, believe that this actually adds to the fabric of this building. I enthusiastically support this uh, encroachment. Back to the mover, Councillor Abia. Members, to you, in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Members, I take you to item 12.7 uh, to, to note, support and authorise, which is a funding deed for Part 25. Can I have a mover, please, members? Item 12.7, Deputy Lord Mayor, thank you. Seconded by Councillor Vershaw. DLM, do you wish to speak to this matter? <laughs> Councillor Vershaw. <laughs> members, any questions, queries or debate? Councillor Martin. Uh, questions for clarity, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm, there's some confusion in as much as you announced this uh, project at Park 25 
would amount to a value of $6.6 million, and yet the accompanying paperwork says that the government will contribute $5 million, and council, which you said would have no contribution uh, other than the roadway, which I'll come to, uh, would also contribute $5 million. Can I have some clarity in regard to that? Certainly, Councillor. CEO? Uh, Beth Anderson Park, thanks. Okay, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor, the, um, the grant is for $6.6 .6 million as per the um, recommendation and the content of the report. <coughs> the attachment was developed um, in anticipation of potential state funding of $5 million. So the, um, as the, the report notes, the images are indicative and the funding levels have since been revised. So the attachment looked at a $4.5 million from the state. It assumed a potential $500,000 uh, contribution from St. Adelaide. Since then, however, the announcement's been made, $6.6 .6 million, no contribution from the City of Adelaide. And now as we go to um, refining the concept and move into engagement and detailed design, the concept will reflect the full amount of the grant. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, another question, Lord Mayor. Um, in the discussion paper of one and two, um, uh, it notes that detailed planning has begun for 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. 5.2 and 5.3 are known to me, but 5.1, it observes the city skate park to be located, as it says in here, in the Riverbank precinct, is new. I've not heard of it. Um, could the administration advise, given that funding has been allocated, and according to the documents, planning has begun, where in the Riverbank precinct is this skate park going? Yes. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, the 5.1, 5.2, 5.3 were three of the four priorities which Council identified in July, I think, Mr Carr, of last year. So the fourth one was for Part 19, which is the now funded Marshmallow Park. Yeah. Reimagining Rhinal has not been funded as yet, apart from the concept, which was a, that separate um, negotiation we had with the state. The Part 26, which is a concept that's been developed um, for consideration but not yet funding, which assumes a city skate park to be a part of that. It also features in that concept a number of other recreational facilities, but I would just underline that that has not yet been funded. It's a concept which is still in negotiation with the state. I understand that, but what we're actually pinning it down to is that it will be in part um, uh, 26, the Riverbank precinct, Given that those negotiations are occurring, I'm asking, has there been a location determined or is it still somewhere around there? Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, still somewhere around there, to use your term, Councillor. It has not been, um, any decisions have been made yet. Part 26 is on the western side. It includes the western side. <coughs> West of Morford Street Bridge, isn't it? Yeah. West of Morford Street Bridge. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And just one final question. Um, is it correct that the administration is asking the elected body tonight um, to give the CEO the authority to start the tender process associated with Park 25, the park outside the Royal Adelaide, um, to start the tender process and execute all of the construction contracts, even though neither APLA nor Council will receive the final plans until next month or later? Is that is that what I'm reading here? See you. Through you, Lord Mayor. The, um, the tender process and executing relevant construction contracts refer to when we get to that point. So the concepts are yet to be uh, completed, the detailed design is yet to be completed, and the engagement is yet to be completed. So when we then get to the point of tendering and issuing construction contracts, then the delegation that we're requesting to the CEO tonight will kick in. So that is correct then. Uh, point three, authorises the chief, chief executive or delegate to negotiate and finalise the deed of conditions of grant to the value of, authorise the CEO to the common deed, blah, 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 blah. So we are giving the CEO authority to start the process tonight without seeing the plans. 
No, it's three and a half. If it helps, um, Lord, yes, I'd no. be happy to amend the uh, paragraph five or to seek to vary paragraph five to get more clarity on that. Because as I understand what um, uh, Beth's saying is that um, the normal processes will take place, um, but what we're just doing is making sure that when the time comes, the chief executive has got that authority. So if we want to put in, if, if you have, if you want to need to vary it to say, you know, upon approval of final plans or something like that. Um, well, I'd be happy. Members, what I'll do is I'll first enable Beth Davidson Park to fully answer the question asked by Councillor Martin, and then DLM, you can reserve your right to do whatever you may wish. But Beth Davidson Park, could you please uh, complete your answer? Thanks. I certainly through you, Lord Mayor. Um, the same. This is consistent with. Um, previous request to council for very similar projects. So we're looking, we will be going through our concept, revised concept, detailed design processes. The concepts will be available to APLA and to council. I propose that we use the design room for that engagement as we are for a number of our projects at the minute. Following that consideration, then we go for um, uh, the tendering and final contract negotiations, entirely consistent with the, the process we're following for all of our projects at the minute. I, uh, I'm still confused. I, I think what you're saying, what I'm asking, that is to say we are providing the authority of the CEO tonight to finalise the tender process, execute the relevant construction contracts as they're related and appropriate up to a value of $6.6 .6 million and it will be next month when we see the plans and we're able to provide feedback, not changes. That's, that's correct, isn't it? Uh, the first part of your statement is correct in terms of the delegation. Um, the detailed concepts and detailed design would not be available next month. That would be... Later. Yeah, well, I'd, later this year. I'd like to propose an amendment for that along the lines of uh, that proposed by uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, and the amendment would be, um, with your permission, Lord Mayor. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'm happy to hear um, Councillor Martin's amendment and perhaps accept it as a variation if that works. But I understand what Councillor Martin's trying to do is just be more specific. Councillor Martin, why don't you share your wording? Uh, you've then got a mover who may accept that as a variation. Sure. The, se the second was Councillor Vershaw. If Councillor Vershaw is comfortable with that as a variation, we can proceed in that manner, then that would save an amendment. So, right. I well, look, Councillor Vershaw, I thought I heard say, uh, upon Council's approval of the final plans, comma, authorises the Chief Executive. Is that, is that correct, Councillor Vershaw? No, I Oh, good, thank you. Okay, okay. I'm, sat I'm satisfied with that amendment or variation. So we do this a variation. So DLM, are you happy with that as a variation from the motion? Yeah. Councillor Vershaw is a seconder. You're happy with that variation. Can I seek general comfort from the room, members? Okay, I've got it. So thank you, Councillor Martin. So members, any further debating on this matter? Councillor Martin, you've okay. asked questions. You Just can by debate. A way of explanation, Lord Mayor, uh, and I'm not going to enter into the debate again, but. Uh, this project in Park 25 is, in my view, an excellent project. Um, it is precisely the sort of development that I would have hoped that the parklands fund that was provided by the government would be used for, and it is consistent with my philosophy about the use of parklands. It is to provide a suitable venue for people to sit, contemplate, recreate, to do whatever, and its location opposite the, uh, the Royal Adelaide does provide the capacity for patients, for visitors to, to, uh, to visit the park, and also for what we know will be a, a growing population in that part of the city to use the park. So it has my 100% endorsement. However, I cannot support this. Uh, it does contain that incredibly controversial $850,000 road to the SACA headquarters, uh, which is in no way related to the park other than that it passes by somewhere. Uh, and I, I cannot agree to giving SACA $1 million. It is the wealthiest sporting organisation in South Australia and possibly one of the wealthiest in Australia. It does not need our ratepayers' funds. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Members, any further debates? Deputy Lord Mayor, to sum up. Well, it's 
summing up, I'd like to um, accept and endorse all of Councillor Martin's comments except for the last couple of sentences um, because I think this is an absolutely fantastic project. I'm really thrilled to bits to do it. Um, the road is on our parklands. It's our road. I think it's our responsibility. Um, but uh, but more, the big picture here is that what we are providing to our community or what with the state government has agreed to provide to our communities to, is to use that parkland's money in exactly the way we want it used, use it in a way that's consistent with our vision for the park, use it in a way that can um, bring real benefits to the community around there, um, including the hospital community. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to us getting on with it. Thank you. Members, I put it before you. Those in favour? Those against? Members, we carry. Thank you. Members, we have a robust agenda this evening, so I'm going to keep us moving. Members, we now go to item 12.8, 2017-18 Event and Festival Sponsorship Recommendations, Lord page 90, to endorse and improve. Lord Mayor, no, sorry, I'm declaring a conflict of interest, Lord Mayor, because I am um, on the advisory board of the Adelaide Motorsport Festival. Thank you, Councillor Maloney. Councillor Clarehan. Lord Mayor, I'd like to um, declare a conflict of conflict of interest because I was on the Adelaide Festival Centre Trust up until April and it talks about a pre-commitment here. So on that basis, um, I'll upset myself. Thank you for sharing with your fellow members, Councillor Clarehan. Now, Councillor Abiyar, were you moving? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Councillor Abiyar. Second to members, please. Councillor Vershaw. Councillor Abiyar, do you wish to speak to the matter? Just briefly, Lord Mayor. Look, um, I just want to acknowledge the huge level of support that the City Council invests in uh, many of the events in the City of Adelaide, including um, and not limited to the film festivals, Peace <laughs> Festival, um, Fringe, obviously, and more events in the City, including Tour Down Under, Clipsal, etc. The one thing I'd like to see in the future, look, obviously this is a, a massive expense or hopefully an investment for our ratepayers, close to 1.7 million uh, a year that we invest in hopefully what could be a branding exercise or support or seed funding, a mix of different things. One of the things I'd like to see in the future is um, next to some of those amounts, maybe if we could sort of table the summary on what we're really providing the funding for, uh, be it as a uh, a for now sort of thing where we're providing seed funding and eventually they can stand on their own two feet on their own events. Uh, is it marketing because our brand's going to be plastered all over the TV and people are going to see it all over the world? It's just good to sort of understand a little bit more about the level of support we're providing um, to some of those um, uh, to some of those events. Um, I acknowledge the importance and also the long-term partnership we've got with most of them as well. So it's important that we work through that. But I just the one thing I'm trying to manage, Lord Mayor, is there's an opportunity always to see people stand on their own two feet, move forward, and have sponsorship support, funding support. We'll free up, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars from our budget to maybe invest in new events that potentially may be interested in starting in our city. Um, I just don't want to keep expanding the pool of investment to the same uh, to the same events and increasing it without uh, knowing, I guess, the value that we're receiving. Um, for the investment or for the right payers' investment in the city of Adelaide. But look, they're all incredible events. Uh, they all attract a lot of people to our city, a lot of exposure. Um, and look, I'm happy to support it, but I think it's important that we uh, provide more information to the public around the value uh, that uh, this, this sponsorship represents and the long term investment that the council may or may not have with some of those uh, event partners as well. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad. Councillor Vishal. Members to the floor. Councillor Abiyad to sum up. Members to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. If we can please invite our fellow elected members back into the chamber.
members, I'll afford uh, fellow members. Here we come. <laughs> In the interest of time, members, I might recommence. Of course, we maintain a quorum. Um, members, item 12.9, which is a cultural strategy and live music action plan, page 94 of your papers. Councillor Vershaw. Um, Lord Mayor, I'd like to move a motion to defer um, at, to a workshop as soon as possible, um, 4th of July if possible, or the next available workshop. You have a second uh, for, from Councillor Moran, um, debate. Thank you. Um, look, I'd like to thank administration for the work that's been done. Um, I do feel that uh, given it is a, a very broad strategy that will go over a period of five years, uh, that it warrants a, a discussion with all councillors present. I'd love to hear the other councillors' views. And um, and so I would like to take it through a workshop process um, to, so that we can have that discussion. Thank you, Councillor Vershaw. Councillor Moran? No. Members, any debate? Councillor Vershaw to sum up. Members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against, the matter is deferred. Thank you, members. Members, I now take you on to item 12.10, which is 2017-18 grant recommendations to endorse, moved by Councillor Abiyad, seconded by Councillor Maloney. Councillor Abiyad, do you wish to speak to that? Just several comments still on the floor, uh, Lord Mayor, but this is sort of a different application process, so it's fine. Councillor Maloney. No, Lord Mayor. Members to the floor, any debate? Councillor Abiyar to sum up. Sumbuff. Members to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Members, item 12.11, acknowledgement of country, rephrasing, moved by Councillor Abiyar, seconded by Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Abiyar, do you wish to speak to it? Uh, no, Lord Mayor. Councillor Clarehan. Members to the floor, any debate? Councillor Vershaw. No. Councillor Abiyar to sum up. Sumbuff. Members for the vote. Those in favour? Those against, we carry item 12.11, which takes us to the annual delegations review 2017, item 12.12. .12. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Abiyad, seconded by Councillor Maloney. Councillor Abiyad, do you wish to speak to the matter? Councillor Maloney. Members. Councillor Martin. Uh, Lord Mayor, I'd like to move uh, an amendment. I'd like to amend uh, section 52, writing off bad debts. Catchment A at page 183 at 52.1.2, the last line altered to $20,000. Oh, uh, the section I'm intending to amend is section 52, attachment A, page 183 at 52.1.2, the last line to be altered to $20,000. Okay, so you need that wording reflected in the recommendation or the motion, should I say. So if you could add to the motion would be the best way for you to achieve that, I presume. So maybe that might be the inclusion. Well, I, I can, instead of adding it to the attachment, I'm happy to say notes uh, the annual review, hereby revokes all previous delegations to the Chief Exec Executive Officer, blah, 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 down to 28th of June, with the exception of um, 52.1.2, which is to remain unaltered at $20,000, or which is to be $20,000. <clears throat> I'll just wait for the Secretariat to record that. If you could look to your screen, please, Councillor, to confirm that's the wording you're seeking to achieve. Yep. No. That's correct. And I'll now look for a second for the purpose of the debate. Councillor Antic had a hand up first. Councillor Martin, you wish to speak to it? Yes, I do, Lord Mayor. Uh, the administration proposes that the CEO is given the new power. Uh, to write off debts uh, without any need whatsoever to consult or inform the elected body when that amount is up to $100,000, whereas until today uh, the amount has been $20,000. Now, the administration advises uh, that historically uh, the only write off of $20,000 or more in recent times um, has been four weeks ago. 
when uh, they brought to council uh, the debt of the parklands. I mean, I think it was Soundwave. I wasn't here on that evening. I think it was Soundwave. Um, is that correct? Yeah, it was uh, a sum in excess of $20,000. Uh, now, uh, that debt was uh, so significant uh, that the administration is now, according to the APWA papers, and to something that will come up later this evening, the APWA papers of June 22nd, at page 20, reviewing how to deal with getting sufficient security out of event proponents to protect council. Uh, it is, as we'll learn later, a work in progress. Um, but it is absolutely important for members of this elected body to be able to ask questions about policy when there are sufficient, uh, uh, significant write-offs of public money, such as uh, the amount uh, associated with sound waves. And uh, there may well be more to come. We are talking about uh, a parklands event that is in uh, deep stuck, uh, and that may well lead to a similar discussion. But this body is not able uh, to fulfil its function to determine whether indeed there needs to be a change in policy in the way in which the organisation handles things such as debt if it doesn't know. And under this proposal, it is possible that one, two, three, four, a whole series of debts worth $99,999.99 could pass through the administration without the oversight of the elected body. So I'm just asking that in the interests of prudence, that members maintain that right to oversight, uh, the right of debts, uh, when they exceed $20,000. It is prudentially um, a wise move, I think, on the part of the selected body uh, to accept that, uh, and I ask members to endorse that. Thank you, Councillor Martin. So, members, you are debating a proposed amendment. Councillor Clarehan, can I ask you to turn off your microphone, please? Your seconder was Councillor Antic. Councillor Antic, do you wish to just debate the matter? No, thanks. Except just to endorse that. You're, um, call me. Your Honour. <laughs> I hold you in very high esteem. <laughs> <laughs> Members to the floor, is there any further debate? Okay, so we're now, uh, Councillor Martin, to sum up on the proposed amendment. Up, okay. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry. So we now have an amended substantive motion which was moved by Councillor Abiyad. Do I have any further debate, Members, on the substantive motion as amended? I don't. It's Councillor Abiyad, in your hands? Sometimes. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, members. Members, we now move to item 12.13, Ombudsman South Australia report. Councillor Wilkinson. I'd like to present myself for this discussion of this item, please. Certainly, Councillor Wilkinson. Now, members, you have an Ombudsman's report to note. Can I have a mover to note? Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Clearahan. DLM, any debate? I reserve my right. Councillor Clearahan? I reserve my right. Members to the floor? Councillor Abiyad? Um, Lord Mayor, I think it's important to um, note due process um, in this and obviously that we have systems uh, within our local government and within our state to assess, protect, investigate and look at options and recommendations at which um, as a council we can proceed and obviously as councillors we can proceed with. Uh, it gives me confidence that in the state we have those abilities and those systems in place uh, for us to be able to go through audit process and for us to assess any risk that potentially could arise from, uh, from mistakes or uh, other actions that any of us as councillors uh, could attract as a result of us serving our constituents. Uh, in office. Uh, granted, we are all uh, humans and errors can occur, uh, but it's also important to note that there's a system uh, that's based around us uh, to assist us facilitate good outcomes that are transparent and available for the public. Um, and with that in mind, I would like to um, obviously note the outcomes of the report. Um, and uh, personally, I, um, uh, I have uh, uh, seen uh, obviously reports in the media, and I note Councillor Wilkinson's apology uh, to the council. And I'm personally um, uh, happy to accept that apology as an act. It was in the media. 
Thank you, Councillor Obiad. Now I've got hands up from uh, Councillor Martin and then Councillor Clarehan. You reserved your rights. I'll come back to you straight after Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin. Uh, just a question, Lord Mayor. Uh, um, Councillor Abiard mentioned that uh, Councillor Wilkinson has made a, a written apology. Um, I would like that apology uh, tabled, incorporated in the minutes. If he's not present, how are we able to do that? Okay, Member, so procedurally we are just briefly debating a report to note. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson will then be rejoining the Chamber where he will be uh, providing a verbal apology to Members and then I will ask the Members to adopt that. Uh, adopt the apology, is that correct? That is correct for the, for the purposes of the, of the Minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. That's correct. Now, Councillor Clarehan, you reserved your right as a seconder. That was your exact question. So, members, do I have any further debate before I hand you back to the Deputy Lord Mayor? DLM? Summed up. Members, those in favour of it to note. Those against, we carry. If we can please invite Councillor Wilkinson back into the chamber. <coughs> Welcome back, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The floor is yours, Councillor. Mm -hmm. I would like to read out a um, public apology further to the Ombudsman report of 15th of June 2017. From myself, Area Councillor Sandy Wilkinson. I note and report the recommendation of the Ombudsman report of the 15th of June 2017, Council's decision of the 27th of June 2017 to adopt the recommendations made by the Ombudsman, which includes a requirement for me to make a public apology. I note the Ombudsman's confirmation that I did not have a material conflict of interest for the purpose of Section 73.1 of the Local Government Act, requiring me to withdraw my chair, leave the room and not vote on the issue. At the time of the Council meeting on the 22nd of November 2016, I correctly considered that I did not have a material conflict of interest on account of the fact that there would not be any benefit perceived by me from the change of policy as any benefit would accrue to heritage property owners. I note, however, the Ombudsman's finding that due to my professional and personal interests as a heritage consultant and as a person who supports the preservation of Adelaide's built heritage in the community's interest, that had an indirect personal interest in the matter that could be seen to influence my decision. I now understand that in these circumstances, I needed to disclose that interest as a perceived or actual interest under 75, Section 75A of the Local Government Act, and to advise the Council whether or not I intended to participate in debate and vote on the issue. I note that there was no requirement for me to withdraw my chair under those circumstances. Many elected members have strongly held views on particular issues, particular matters, often being the very matters that motivated them to stand for local government. For example, a member might stand for council on a business platform motivated by their involvement in city businesses. I acknowledge that, like most people, I've developed views and opinions on various topics, including heritage, but I maintain that this does not prevent me from bringing an open mind to bear in my decision making. To remedy this situation and for future policy matters involving heritage restoration funding, I intend to ask Council to note my perceived or actual interest, to inform Council how I intend to handle this interest, that is whether or not I intend to stay in the room and debate and vote on the matter. I, like many elected members in local government, find the new March 2016 conflict provisions complex and confusing. However, I now have a greater understanding of the obligations on elected members in these circumstances. I tender an unreserved apology to Council and the ratepayers for my failure to comply with this requirement on this occasion. Finally, I know that I would have been quite entitled to remain in the room and debate and vote on the motion. Accordingly, my failure to disclose the actual or perceived interest had no impact on the council decision. Well, sincerely, thank you. Thank you, councillors. Now, members, can I please have a motion for that to be incorporated into the minutes? Councillor Aviard, seconded by Councillor Clarehan. Any debate members? All those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. 
Members, I will just look to the gallery. It is customary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that should any photographs be taken in the council chamber that you receive the uh, approval of the presiding member of the council chamber in advance. So I ask that any photographs taken during the course of this meeting not be used. Thank you. Members, the, we move on to our next item, which is 12.14, Adelaide Festival Centre Trust Board, which is page 453 of your papers. You have a uh, recommendation to note, please, members. So, Deputy Lord Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Clarahan. Now, members, what I will uh, do is that I will do a procedural motion and then I will call for nomination. So, we are doing the procedural motion first, members. So, do I have any debate about the procedural motion? I don't. DLM, so you're summing up on the procedural motion. Thank you. So members, I now take you to the vote. Those in favour, those against, we carried. Now I seek nominations. Deputy Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, can I nominate um, Councillor Bernard Shaw, Councillor Corbell and Councillor Martin. We need three nominees for the I know those. Those three um, have expressed an interest and maybe some others. So I look to the councillors, Councillor Vershaw, Councillor Corbell and Councillor Martin. Do you accept if nominated? All three do. Thank you very much. So I would now need... Do I have any further nominations, members? I don't. I only have three. So I would need all three, Councillor Vershaw, Councillor Corbell, Councillor Martin, to leave the chamber. I don't. I'm just keen to deal with it. It's Whilst the members so vote. <laughs> to replace my position. Now, members, can I please have a mover to move a motion to uh, put forth Councillor Vershaw, Councillor Corville, Councillor Martin. Moved by Councillor Moran and seconded by Councillor Clarehan. So, members, those in favour, those against, we carry. Thank you, members. And we'll invite our fellow members back into the chamber. We'll continue. Members, thank you. We will continue and I will take you on to item 12.15 to note. Uh, can I move it, please, members? Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Clarahan. Any debate, Councillor Moran? No. Councillor Clarahan, members to the floor. Councillor Moran, summing up. Summing up. Members to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry item 12.15, which takes us on to item 12.16. Prudential Issues Report uh, Bikeways Project. Members, that was emailed to you today. It may not appear on your agenda. Late item. Uh, to receive and note this item, members, do I have a mover? <laughs> Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Martin. Councillor Moran, any debate? Uh, no, no, it's just to note, isn't it? It is to note, that's correct. Councillor Martin? Uh, no, just thank you to the administration for making it a, a public uh, those slides are redacted. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Members, any debate? Mm -hmm. Councillor Moran to sum up. Sum up. Members to the floor. Those in favour? Those against? We carry item 12.16, which now takes us to questions on notice. Members, uh, Councillor Antic, uh, you have the first question on notice regarding Green Wall. Would you wish to read your Count your question on notice to the chamber, or do you would like to take it as read? As read. Okay, councillor, it's a relatively lengthy answer to your question on notice. Are you happy for the answer to be taken as read? I think so, Lord Mayor. Okay, and we can ensure that the answer to these questions on notice are distributed to all members of the gallery, including the media, please. Thank you. If I could go on to the second question on notice, which is item 13.2, which is Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, you've got a question on notice regarding Council's Dunn Street car park. Uh, would you like to read your question to the Chamber, or you take that as read? Take it as read, Lord Mayor. Members, I will read the answer to this one because it 
uh, sits with the one-page policy, so to speak. So the answer to Councillor Martin's question, I notice, is currently neither location is on the list of future priority locations for the City of Adelaide Safe CCTV Network, which is owned and maintained by Council and operated in partnership with the South Australian Police. The City Safe CCTV Network is predicated on preventing and reducing crime against the person rather than the protection of assets. The purpose of the City Safe CCTV network is to enhance the perception of public safety and to provide evidence where crimes against the person occur. Any proposed camera location should meet at least one of the following criteria. One, a high level of crime against the person. Two, a reasonable expectation that the personal safety of citizens is at risk. Three, for other city safety purposes as explicitly agreed by Council and SAPOL. The vandalism experience at the Dunn Street car park does not necessarily meet these categories. In addition, we advise this area of Melbourne Street is not on the CCTV strategic group's list of priority locations for future CCTV installations and is therefore unlikely to be given precedence over existing strategic group priorities. Over time, as Council delivers its strategic plan, technology, technology may permit the exploration of next generation CCTV surveillance using uh, our Adelaide free Wi-Fi, the 10 gig city project, optical fibre network and digital display kiosks. Members, the third question on notice was from Councillor Martin uh, regarding granting of licences, park plans, events. Councillor Martin, um, would you like your question, would you like to read your question? No, Lord Mayor, and may I say an answer isn't necessary as it was discussed this very matter in the recent item related to delegations. Thank you, Councillor. So we'll take that question as read. Thank you very much, Councillors, for your questions on notice, which takes us to questions without notice. Members, do I have any questions without notice? I don't see any hands, so I'll take you on to motions on notice. The first motion, sorry, Councillor Mullaney. My apologies, Lord Mayor, I've got a question on, without notice. I just Certainly wanted to ask, uh, will this council get a report on um, the, from the recent AGLA uh, National Congress, I think is the exact title of it, on how the motions and how we voted on those motions? I'm just wondering if we will get any feedback on that. I'm assuming you will, Councillor, so I'll hand you to our CEO. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, yes, we'll be providing a detailed report. Thank you, Councillor Mullaney. Members, any further questions on notice before I move you along on the agenda? I don't, so I take you to motions on notice. Uh, first motion on notice is item 15.1, Councillor Martin, motion on notice regarding quick response funding. Councillor Martin, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, do I require a second, Lord Mayor? Yes, you do, Councillor. Okay, uh, for the sake of the debate. Councillor Clarehan. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this is, in fact, the motion that came to Council two weeks ago and which members asked that I defer so that the administration can provide advice, which is attached under administration comment. And I'm hoping that the administration's comments provide some comment, uh, comfort rather, to members uh, who were looking for assurance that the uh, the criteria for the proposed additional funding uh, was in fact a valid criteria. Um, now, the question is how will this money be used to help the city's homeless organisations care for marginalised and vulnerable people in the city? An example was provided to me uh, by uh, a member of ICAG and uh, for the benefit of elected members, ICAG is the organisation representing the 11 small organisations who work directly at the coalface of homelessness work. Um, they, in fact, are the people who are there every night, every day, operating food trucks, uh, asking people if they're okay, if they require help. And uh, a good example of the, uh, the funding uh, uh, that they require uh, involved a cold snap which occurred uh, recently in the city. Um, you might remember it. Uh, the temperature plummeted for a period of days and one night I think it went down to two degrees. And during this emergency, um, and it was an emergency, it was called a code blue, which is the jargon. Um, the homeless organisations that were party to that agreement were all supposed to open. Well, for some reason they didn't, and only one opened. 
Um, and it was not satisfactory to a large number of homeless people because of uh, uh, mental, uh, uh, um, or sorry, social dysfunctional or mental illness. Uh, that is to say, they just wouldn't go there because they feared for their safety, didn't like the way it was run, or in the case of some, and some of them were women, thought it was just an inappropriate location. And so this group proposed that they would sleep in the streets around Adelaide with a blanket. Now the homeless organisation uh, reasoned, not unreasonably, that in a two degree evening, a blanket wasn't going to afford any protection to anyone. And so they had to find a means, and they did eventually, to their credit, they had to find a means of getting some hundreds of dollars together very quickly to buy heavy duty ground sheets and to buy heavy duty swags, which were duly <laughs> issued to that group of homeless people uh, for whom the only alternative that night was a blanket on the streets of Adelaide. Now, um, that they were organ able to organize the funding, which uh, helped them for a, a period of nights, was sensational. But uh, it's not always the case. And indeed, there are some. May I have just a small extension, Lord Mayor, please? I'll look to your fellow members. Is there comfort? There is comfort. Thank you. Two minutes. Um, there are other instances, uh, and for example, extremes of weather are very hard to predict, as we know in this city. Uh, in summer, for example, uh, the uh, ICAG members and others distribute water to the homeless. Now, generally, about two pallets a day is required. Often, they don't have the funds, and none of them have the storage space. So it has to be purchased at the time. That is a real emergency, and it's so serious that many of the homeless become so dehydrated, they actually have to be taken by the homeless organisations for rehydration uh, in hospital, or at least to a medical practice. Now, another illustration of the same thing is that when homeless people put down their name with housing providers to be accommodated, in the interim, they live wherever they can, sometimes in a shelter, sometimes on the streets. But when the housing provider says, we have accommodation, then they have to act within a very defined period, 24, 48 hours, to take and occupy that housing. And homeless providers actually have to go out and find the money to buy a bed or bedding at the very minimum to provide them with the essentials that they don't have the financial resources to purchase. Now that is something that is not predictable nor able to be budgeted for because it depends on the whim of the housing providers who incidentally, Lord Mayor, can actually all decide at one time that half a dozen, a dozen homeless in the city uh, are able to go into uh, housing that's being provided. Now, the measure, if you approve it, will allow the CEO to issue uh, funds up to a maximum of $10,000, but clearly amounts that are much less than that uh, with his delegated authority. Um, the, the council, the elected body, will be made aware of those amounts, but uh, they are uh, to be provided on an as-needs basis. Uh, and it is possible that the funding won't be expended. But it, it is, in my view, given that this is the worst crisis we have for homelessness in this city, a very small gesture, and one that would enable uh, the elected body to say that we stand shoulder to shoulder <coughs> with these organisations working at the front line of homelessness. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Clarehan, you second it. Members, to the floor, DLM. Lord Mayor, I've, I've got a lot of sympathy with this motion because I also understand that um, this is the, the level of homelessness we've got in the city is unprecedented, at least in my time of living in the city, and that's well over 30 years. Um, but I still don't fully understand the motion, and so I've got a couple of questions, and I'm sorry, my iPad is, has um, stopped working. Um, so I don't, I, I, I'm unable to... Um, access the administrative comments. Um, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Are we simply adding $80,000 to the Council's Community Development Grants Fund? Is that what this is seeking to do? And then expending that on quick response grants under the existing 
structure of the fund, or are we setting up a separate and different fund altogether? I still don't quite get it. CEO. <laughs> sure, thanks. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, as I understand, we're making provision for an additional $80,000 to be accessed by the existing community development grant uh, process. However, we would only access it as and uh, when required and would report to Council quarterly um, if we gave our grants on that basis. So, uh, in essence, my team would have available an extra $80,000 to distribute to um, appropriate um, applications as they came through uh, the year, so it tops up the existing amount we had available, but um, uh, we would report quarterly as and, as and when uh, those, those monies were, were accessed. Um, and, and that would be distributed under the existing criteria, which is under CEO delegation or for amounts uh, up to $2,000 under my own delegation. So um, I wonder whether the, uh, well, if I can just um, put my perspective and then I wonder whether Councillor Martin might consider a minor variation. I, I do think we do need to do something about homeless and I do think we do need to do something about it now. But I also think we need to have a very stitched up approach to homelessness. And this is a bit ad hoc. And I understand sometimes you need to respond in an ad hoc manner to an emergency situation or to a, to a crisis. Um, but I um, foreshadow that um, uh, when we get to motions without notice, I'm going to be proposing a motion without notice that the administration um, uh, assemble, I can't remember the wording, I've got it here somewhere, that we have a workshop on homelessness. Um, where we actually we, we get a bit of better grip on what the issue is from our perspective as, as a city. Um, one of the difficulties is we do not want to get in the space of taking over the work of the, of the state government. It's state government, homelessness is a state government responsibility. But we do need to make sure that we are, um, we are working well with them. I know um, uh, in the last term of um, council, because of some other activities that we undertook, we drew together a number, the council was um, responsible in drawing together a number of the key agencies uh, and bringing them all into the same room at the same time and getting them to talk to each other. And surprisingly, they hadn't been talking to each other really until we undertook that. So, uh, so I'm really keen that we get a really good grip on who is doing what, what is proposed by different agencies, and we have a really good understanding. And I think the first we need a workshop in order to uh, ask our administration to provide us with that information so that we really know where we sit. So if Councillor Martin was willing to amend this so that it just become a 12, just for a 12 month, I mean, I'm not sure if that's your intention anyway, but just for the for the next 12 months we do this. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, if that's it's not explicit in the motion that it's only a short term. Pro Proposal, but if that if that was the intent and you were willing to vary to make that explicit, then I'm very happy to support it. Um, on the understanding that um, that we have a workshop, or as I said, I'll put a motion and see if I can talk people into it that we schedule a workshop uh, to, to actually address the issue on a larger in a in a small kind of holistic way. So do you want to propose the variation? Um, so would that be for the 17-18 financial year in that case? It's just a, a clarification. It's not an alteration of the substance of the motion. It is just a clarification that has been sought, and I'm happy to accept that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, members, any further debate? Councillor Clarehan, you reserved your right. You should speak. Lord Mayor, I think um, this city does need to have a heart. And we do need, and we do acknowledge that homelessness is increasing across Australia, not just here in the city of Adelaide. And indeed, it was brought up at the National Congress as an issue of concern. Um, however, I think we need to be very mindful that um, homelessness is a state government responsibility, as, as the Deputy Lord Mayor has already said. And um, I think that we need to be careful that we don't pick up the funding that should be coming from the state government. However, in terms of emergencies and as a stopgap measure, I think we do need to put our hands in our pocket. We do need to show that this city has a heart and we do need to be at the ready in emergency situations. And so, uh, as a stopgap measure, I would support this. However, I, as Deputy Lord Mayor has said, we do need to come together 
We do need to find out where we're up to. As you say, we were responsible for instigating the Senior Officers Group, SOG, um, who have a holistic view of what's going on. And that's not what we've got here. You know, we don't have that holistic view and we need it in order to, in, uh, to make sure that the, the money that we are um, budgeting for is used appropriately and very wisely. But I do support this as a stopgap measure. Thank you, Councillor Clearhand. Summing up, Councillor Martin. Uh, yeah, look, just very briefly, Lord Mayor, I, I welcome Councillor Hinder's uh, proposal for a workshop to discuss homelessness. I think that's a really positive initiative for this council. And moreover, will provide a, an opportunity for us to all understand the way in which organisations interact with one another, which ones are where in the pecking order, and how they all relate to state and federal government. Um, I accept uh, the concern of my colleagues that uh, homelessness is um, uh, for them a, a matter for the state government, but unfortunately uh, state and federal governments aren't always able to assist the homeless. And indeed, the incident I mentioned about the code blue occurred because of an absence of state government decision making in that area. So uh, I, I actually think there is a responsibility on all of us to do something and by accepting this motion I think we're demonstrating that we are accepting our share um, of what needs to be done, providing uh, the administration with the capacity to respond quickly when there is an emergency. And, and I thank members for their support. Members, I put it before you. Those in favour? Those against, we carry. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Maloney, motion and notice delivering on Council's strategic objectives. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll be brief as it's getting late. Um, part of our strategic plan, we uh, seek to be a city that. Um, Councillor, you've got a second with the Deputy Lord Mayor, so please oh, continue. Okay. Yeah, about that bit. See that um, plans and, uh, <coughs> that uh, attract, wants to attract entrepreneurs and new businesses and to be a leader in the startup community. Um, it's also a mechanism in which we will achieve city population growth, um, city um, entrepreneurs that live and work um, in the city and also create employment opportunities. One of the things that I've um, sort of been um, working with the administration on and the um, business incubator operators and wider stakeholders is what really is going to be our role in this space. And I still think there's some dots to be connected. So what I would like to do is for us to have a council workshop to discuss what our role is going to be. Also ask the, um, the key stakeholders, and that includes the property sector, because I think they have a, a role to play, state government, what their role is going to be in this space, and um, those that are going to be running these um, um, entities. So I, I ask that we bring those stakeholders together to have a workshop and then we can actually make an informed decision about what our role is going to be in this space. So it's quite as simple, simple as that um, and help us make the strategic objectives that we've set in our strategic plan. Thank you, Councillor Mulaney. Seconded by Deputy Lord Mayor. Yeah. Members to the floor. Any debate? Councillor Mulaney to sum up. Summed up. Members to vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, Councillor Malani. Item 15.3, Councillor Antic. Motion on notice regarding City Street Greening Project. Councillor? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'll move, um, I'll, perhaps I'll read it out because it uh, makes more sense. The Council's future CBD green, street greening, see, sorry, Council's future CBD city street greening projects utilise a variety of European species in preference to species such as native, native grasses and eucalypts, as an example. Selected from the range specified in the Adelaide Design Menu on the forthcoming City Landscape Plan as part of the City Green, the Green City Plan, and um, articulate how this preferential selection will be applied. I see seconder. You have a seconder for Councillor Moran. The floor is yours, Councillor Antic. Once again, Lord Mayor, we are all tired and um, emotional. And um, <laughs> I, no, I prefer never to hug anyone ever. That's possible. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, one thing I do like to hug are European plants, Lord Mayor, because they are truly, truly uh, worthwhile pursuits. We, we have at the moment a number of really good um, streets and tree projects, uh, a number of really good uh, planting projects, which we've seen everywhere, in particular down my neck of the woods on Holtby Street, some really good stuff. 
Um, some of them are excellent, I would say, and colourful and do exactly what they're designed to do, uh, mainly um, you know, spruce up the street rather than save the planet. <laughs> it's pretty decorative, more than functional in my view. But anyway, notwithstanding that they do their job, the only issue is, Lord Mayor, that um, uh, we seem to be seeing increasing numbers of eucalypts and native grasses, which are, and, and call this um, a value judgment, in my view, inappropriate for the other parts of the city. I think they're excellent in the outside <laughs> ring of the parklands where you know there's more of a native feel, but in the inner sanctum of the city, uh, I'd really like to see more European species planted because I think they're avenue trees which really do a great job. You see the difference between uh, some of the trees in, uh, and I see the deputy Lord Mayor's going to jump in here and shoot me down for being some sort of, some sort of vegetation <laughs> Prejudice, but anyway, but the reality is they do, they do. In my view, the, the, <clears throat> the view out onto Light Square when the autumn leaves are falling uh, is magnificent. Um, there are some risks, of course, associated with eucalypts and some of the native species, which from falling tree branches they're particularly prone to. And I'd just like to see that pendulum swing back to some of our beautiful avenue trees and some of the very nice drought-resistant. I might point out for their um, uh, European plants, such as. Uh, lavender, rosemary, and all those sorts of things, which I think are a bit more aesthetically pleasing. There are some examples floating around uh, down the, ex uh, the western aspect of uh, Grove Street, I think, or one's over there. Anyway, of, of native grasses which have been planted, which are really, really quite overgrown um, and quite scrubby. So, um, look, the centre of the city is not the bush, uh, and uh, uh, it shouldn't be treated in that way, in my view. I think we have some ceremonial trees which will, will go beautifully in those areas, and I'd like to see that taken on as a preference. Um, and it can be done from a from a water tolerant uh, perspective. And uh, I think everyone wins. It's win win win, Lord Mayor. The blue sky thinking. Hmm? The blue sky thinking. Oh, thank you, Councillor Anton. The blue sky thinking. Now, Councillor Anton, your motion was seconded by Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to it? Reserving your right, so we have Councillor Vershaw. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I would encourage my colleagues to go up to uh, the design room and have a look at the palette uh, that has been put on display there, uh, which um, several members had a look this afternoon. Um, the, the design manual has used a wide range of both European and Australian or native species, um, including the Tuckaroo. <laughs> and, um, as well as low plants, as well as using those ones that um, Councillor Antic mentioned, such as lavender and rosemary, etc., for the planting. Um, I think they've done a magnificent job in terms of the variety and also uh, looking at different heights and, and areas of the city that can be planted, and also the rollout of that over the next few months. Thank you, Councillor Vishal. Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I'm not going to vote for this, but um, but not because I don't want the same thing that Council Antic wants. Um, that is a beautiful city. I just don't think you necessarily need to plant with European trees to get a beautiful city. Um, I have been up to the design room and had a look at what the current design manual includes, and it is a vast array of plants. Some of them are European, some of them are, are native plants, and there, you know, there's a there's a big um, a, array to choose from. In my view. Working out how to make the city look beautiful is not necessarily only about the choice of plants, it's about the way that plants are planted. And I urge um, councillors who want to see native plants bringing real beauty to inner city environments to have a look at how Melbourne plants their native plants, to have a look at how Canberra plants their native plants. What they do is have mass plantings um, of uh, of grasses or whatever, which bring real dramatic effect. Um, and I think they can be used with, with real purpose in inner city locations. Um, not to say that we don't sometimes want to have a plane tree or some lavender, but I don't think we only want to have plane trees or lavender. We want to be able to use our indigenous plants to bring beauty to, a, to our nation. And we are Australian. I would like our city to feel like an Australian city. Um, it, we are the driest state in the driest nation, so I think we also need to be mindful of, of the, the watering issues that come with planting plants that are actually designed for a much, much higher rainfall. And I, I accept that there are some um, uh, uh, European plants that, that don't call for, for quite that much. But 
I guess what I'm saying is I actually think our design manual does exactly what it needs to do right now. That is, it gives our, uh, our um, design team a palette from which to choose and it includes both ends of the spectrum. And I think it's about making sure that when we get projects that come to us, we actually have a look carefully at what the plantings are. Going up and having a look today at the way some of the plantings have been proposed for, and I know they're just indicative sketches, but the way some of the plantings have been proposed for the market to Riverbank, absolutely magnificent looking display, in, in, in some cases incorporating um, uh, um, European trees, in some cases incorporating uh, indigenous plants, and in both cases I think bringing what we want, that is a beautiful city centre. So I, I think we've got what we need, I think we've got the palette we need, we just need to be really, really vigilant to, to ensure that it's applied uh, in the way that we want to see it applied. Thank you, DLM. I've got uh, Councillor Corbell followed by Councillor Aviad, followed by Councillor Moran. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I've got the update design manual um, here in front of me, and when I flip through it, it's pretty clear that um, with each of the palette, it's inclusive of native and non-native species, um, English elm, Japanese pagoda trees, there's, there's a myriad of examples of non-native species in here which are already part of our Adelaide Design Manual um, greening palette, which is selected um, for implementation across our streets as we speak. I'm looking forward to seeing um, the upcoming city landscape plan and how we're going to have extra levels of detail provided to the community and us as an elected body about how all of that will be implemented. But at the moment, I don't think that we need to have a preference for non-native species. Um, I think we've got a good balance already. And what I want to see is more greening across the city. And I'm happy for that greening to have the balance of native and non-native. I don't want to see um, a preference for non-native species. So because of that, I can't support this. I think um, I'm happy with our work that's already been undertaken. We've got a green city plan, um, which will be coming for us um, to us for endorsement in July, I believe. Um, so I'm happy with the status quo at this stage. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Councillor Abia. I just never thought I'd look to see a motion that says green antic and trees in it. So, um, look, I um, I see where Councillor Antic is coming from. I just I have just a slight concern. I'm not sure if he's. I don't know if he could vary the motion, but um, my big my worry is. Um, I like what he's done in relation to the selection range from a specified the Adelaide design manual. I think it's coming from the design manual we're working on. My issue with um, what if it's not suitable for a specific um, environment? So the, the issue of in preference may not be. Sorry. It's not locked in stone. It says in preference. See, I mean, if, if we were to say instead of, so Council of Future CBD, okay. City Street. I'm happy to support this if we implement this minor change. Council's Future CBD City Street Greening Project utilise a variety of European species where suitable in preference, maybe. Or, uh, are you prepared to take that on board, Councillor? I mean, so sort of where. I'm just trying to formulate my own mind in a second. So, what I'm trying to say here, if when suitable, I'm just worried that your motion potentially, Councillor, may. Uh, pretty much prefer uh, specific species of trees over others, even if they're not suitable for a specific area. Where suitable in preference. So basically, after the comma of European species, where suitable in preference. So Councillor Antic, gets the insertion of two words in the first sentence, which would then read, where suitable in preference, as opposed to purely in preference. So why don't we, yeah, that's another way to do it. Council of Future CBD City Greening Projects on, um, utilise a variety of European trees. Selected from? Yeah, selected from the range of specified in the Adelaide Design Manual. Are you satisfied? Are you happy with that, Council? So, Lord Mayor, if I can just... Yes, members, sorry if we can have some attention, please. We're proposing a variation of the... Yes, so the Council Future CBD City Street Greening Project utilise... Yes, members, please, quiet. 
Council's future CV, Council Future CBD City Street Greening Project utilises a variety of European species selected from the range of specified in the Adelaide Design Manual and the forthcoming City Landscape Plan articulate how this preferential selection will be applied. So this will provide advice and administration our field will be on where some areas would have that as a suitability versus a preference no matter what. So is that, are you comfortable with that Councillor? Okay, so the Secretariat captured those words? We have, so... Okay, are you, no, I understand are you happy you. with that Councillor? Members are all of your iPads operating? Okay. They're on. Has it changed? Oh, it's frozen. They're frozen. Okay. So, Councillor Antic, you will need to do this just by recalling the words of uh, Councillor Rabiano suggesting a variation. Right. It doesn't actually, I mean, look, I, it's sort of a bit of a nothing. Yeah. Um, variation. It doesn't actually do anything. It just sort of says, you know, in, in, in certain aspects we might decide on doing things maybe if we like to, possibly. I just need yeah. a yes or yeah. no. So, so look, the variation. You know, the, the, I suspect that um, the uh, overwhelming uh, will of the uh, chamber is going to be against it otherwise, so um, uh, we'll, I'll just, we'll, I don't care, let's just put it in, yeah. All right, so you'll accept the variation, thank you. Your second uh, was Councillor Moran, yes. I look to the floor for general comfort about the variation. Members, yes, there is. Okay, so thank you. So now I've got further debating. I've got who did I have? Yes, of course you can, Councillor Avian. So look, I understand um, in some aspects of the city, and this is what I'd like to see. Uh, hopefully, this motion deliver on board, Mayor, is the opportunity to be able to include some of those species, which is already as part of our Adelaide design manual. But the bit I enjoy is the articulate how this preferential selection will be applied. So if there is opportunities around the city to use those kinds of species over, over others, where it fits within the area, where it provides the right amenity, where it provides the right look, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then potentially that's something that should be considered. Um, and yeah, that's the intent of what um, I was asking Councillor Ante to consider. And I thank him for taking that on board. Okay, members, do I have any further? Councillor Moran. Yes, the original unvaried motion. I'm happy to accept the varied motion. I don't really see any difference, but um, uh, just members, discussing it. Members, please. Council Rand speaking. Just discussing it. I think the pension, it, it, it's, it's very well for Priscilla to, 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 to say that we've gone the design manual and everything, but it's how it is being. I'll wait for Ben. Sorry. Sorry. It's Sorry. how it's being used is the important. The design manual is delightful. The palette's delightful. The pictures are delightful. But um, as Sandy Wilkinson once told me in um, in architecture school, landscape architect school, when we were arguing, remember about more plain trees, more European trees in our European square, and the rather dangerous spotted gums are saying. It was noted that the modern young architect, Elaine Saint architect, is very much towards the native grasses, and I'm not, not criticising that at all, but there has a, been a sharp pendulum swing since the days of Rosemary Boko, who brought in lavender, um, still, still not European plants, by the way, um, desert plants, and roses, and we became the rose city. But now I notice down and um, which was lovely, I and mean, they're, they're robust. But there's been a swing to, and it, it's not correct to say that what um, Councillor Adams says is not happening. It is happening down um, in Halifax Street. The native grasses have not worked, and if you talk about hay fever analogies, I tell you what, they are killers. They would be much better replaced by more. Um, uh, I can't think of the word nature or uh, um, less uh, weedy looking things. And I, I'm unaware that we plant any non-European uh, tree in our streets. We plant a lot in our, um, well, I don't see any gum trees. I lived in Unley for years and there's a multi-million, you, you do not plant dry weather trees, such as gums in, tree, in streets with houses because they are water wanderers and they go straight for your foundations. You plant a tree with a taproot. Um, the London plane tree is not a European tree, um, there, so that's a tiny bit of a misnomer. What we want in our streets is a more formalised avenues of trees. One of the most beloved parts of our parklands, the, the, the gum tree parklands where I live are beautiful, but we also have the beautiful, is it cedar or elm tree carriageway? There is room for more plantings of the Europeans, and I feel that the pendulum is swinging. You have a look at swinging away from that, and I just I think what <laughs> Councillor Antic is wanting is to swing it back. 
We look down at, um, and Sue's complained long and hard about, and she's right, Montefiore Road, um, play, replaced by native succulents. I don't mind them personally, but don't tell me that the, 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 the plants in the pallet are being planted. Only a section of them are. The reason that natives aren't being put in our streets is because we have to replace like with like. Thank God. Um, we've now got this crazy system where when uh, down Molesworth Street that I've complained to the administration about, where we only plant London plants where there are no um, overhead lines and we plant little trees on the other side, completely flying in the face of the work that we want to underground. So we're going to have weird streets like Molesworth Street with a big high side and a little pruner's side. So I think we do need to get back into control of what we want planted in our streets and not just say it's all fabulous, um, the natives, of course the natives love it in the parklands, <coughs> but in our streets and our verges, we Council need to... Council, time is run. Are you seeking we more need time? To, no, no, I'm not seeking any Thank more you. time. We need to get back to the, uh, to the traditional plants. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, yeah, I um, share the sentiment of Councillor Ant in terms of the, uh, the European sort of plants, tree, trees particularly. Some of the, I think some of the native grass things can look quite, quite good, but it's the trees where you want the big spreading canopious trees that touch in the middle of the road, like Gover Street. That's what makes a beautiful city. And front row, um, the plane trees there. Um, I'm, I'm concerned with seeing, like in Melbourne Street, you have these native French panies that, that have no canopy, offer no shade, and uh, that's a you know, no native tree, for example. You know that, and whereas they've also got the litsias there, which have a nicer canopy and stuff like that. So you know, my sort of um, the sentiment that I share with Councillor Antic is, is that I want lush looking. Plants in general, the European ones have a lush, lush look, and, and and when you're walking around the urban environment, it just give a cooler, lusher feel. Whereas uh, native trees tend to have a more arid landscape kind of feel, which is appropriate in the parklands on the whole. But uh, um, so um, with the wording the variations, it's not quite so absolute. But I think the general thrust is, you know, we're not. Native people, native uh, vegetation uh, zealots are just going to want to make the city all that. I mean, we have uh, preferences towards uh, the more luscious sort of plants, um, the, the more, much more minor aspect of the, uh, um, the the native trees within the city proper, but in the parklands where, where we uh, have it as, as natural bush and have that more arid landscape effect. Thank you, Councillor. Before I hand you back to the mover, I'll briefly speak. I wholeheartedly, sorry, DLM, you have spoken oh, to this matter. Have a question, you have a question? Yes, of course. Oh, sorry, Sam, can I ask the Riverbank, the Market Riverbank, that is, does, does that have a mixture of native and non-native plants? Because that's what I'm interested in. That's true, you look there. Yes, yes, it does. Given that this now says that wherever um, <coughs> uh, that in preference to where, but where they are suitable, I can't find the language. Okay, that we utilise European plants preferentially in places where they are suitable. Does that mean we have to redesign? And and would you be reading that as saying now we have to take out the native plants that are in that area? that we had designed in and replaced them with European plants as long as we can find suitable European plants. That's how I read it. <coughs> well, we're saying we're that, well, how else do we prefer European plants if we're not preferring them in places where they can be planted? What's the intention there? Yes. Through you, Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, it, it does talk clearly about um, preferential selection. So the way that I would suggest we would interpret this is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, clearly noted that we would not be putting um, uh, eucalypts, gum trees in um, inner city or highly populated residential areas, and, and we've had that discussion, you know, a number of times. So clearly noted that. 
Um, depending on, I guess, the, the effect, the impact we're looking for um, that responds best to the concept <laughs> designs is the species that we would select. But clearly from this, we are not just choosing from a native palette, we're choosing from both native and exotic, and we'd be recommending the very best, what we would see as the very best um, species for the, um, the design, whether it be uh, standalone trees, whether it be some of the understory, or as you've seen this afternoon, a number of the arbors that we're suggesting uh, we put in in some areas of market to Riverbank and indeed in um, the Gawler Place concepts. Well, just a point of, again, a point of clarification, um, a little bit. That, what, what um, Gawler Place has in there is actually status quo. That is, we go to our design, Palette and we choose from the design palette what we think is appropriate for the locations. Um, we're being asked by this amendment, or sorry, by this uh, motion, to prefer European plants. Surely that has to bring a difference to our approach. You Does leading start? this to a question, DLM? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a question. So my question is, what do you yes. think actually going to Thank make you. on the ground? Thank you, Beth. Beth. Yeah. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, my understanding is that it, it clearly requires us to ensure that we do choose from European species as well as native species. Mm. Members, I'll, before I put you back to the mover, uh, Councillor Vershaw, you have spoken, so you can only ask a question on this matter. Well, I'm just asking because what you seem to be reading is not what I'm reading in front of me. It's not what's asked yet. Well, what, so, what, so my, my question is, is, is the, thing, the motion in front of me what we are debating at the moment? Because it's, it's not what was said. Okay, Carly, can you please read out the motion to the members, please? Uh, through the Chair, the motion that is before you reads that Council's future CBD city street greening projects utilise a variety of European species selected from the range specified in the Adelaide Design Manual and that the forthcoming city landscape plan as a part of the Green City Plan articulate how this preferential selection will be applied. Okay, so members, that's what you've been debating. So I'm just going to hand you to the CEO. CEO? Just three of them now. The iPad we've been looking at here doesn't reflect those changes, so that's why Beth's been giving you that advice. So we might need to clarify our response. Just to <laughs> okay, Beth, would you like to speak to this? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, thank you. And uh, thank you, Carly. This, what's in front of us now, does actually require us, by my reading, to utilise European species in any CBD based city greening projects. So we have to redesign the market through. Uh, we we would have to yes, we would we would need to have another look at what we've put in there and anything which is native would need to come out. I suggest it would be the same for Gawler Place and uh, the forthcoming North Terrace project and any other of the many, many plantings we are um. Yes, on behalf the of the members, can I just please ask the words in preference to been removed. Uh, does that then provide you with the comfort that you need? Because this is not mandating, this is preferring. Okay. Beth, I'll ask another question if I could. The, the last few words of the motion as it stands, I apologise members, neither have mine updated, uh, articulate how this preferential selection will be applied. The word preference or preferential is still there. Does that provide you with the comfort that you need? Okay. 
I believe that we need to take this on notice just to be really clear and come back to you with how it will be interpreted because there's thus simply some confusion. I'm sorry, I've had my hand up. I've not had any acknowledgement from anyone, if you don't mind. Councillor Clarehan. Lord Mayor, I'd like to defer this matter because I don't believe, well, I'll need a seconder. I move to defer this. You have a second to a Councillor Milani who has not yeah. yet spoken, so yes. Look, Lord Mayor, I just don't think we understand the true implications of this. You know, do we really know the difference between a callistamin and a ficus? Do we really understand it? There are so many different species that can go together so well, and here we are saying no. Rip out the, you know, the myoporum parvifolum and let's plant it with some lavender or roses. So, you know, these have huge implications and we need to be very aware of the extent of those implications. And to start designing on the run like this, I think is absurd. And for that reason, I think this does need to be deferred for a workshop so that we understand the true implications of what this means. Okay, so we've got a motion to amend, which is a motion to defer. Councillor Milani, you seconded? Yeah. Okay, members, any further debate? DLM, we're debating I, I, an amendment. I support the mo a motion to defer and I highly recommend that members go up and have a look at the design room in the interim and have a look at what's being planned, which is not a preference, it's a mixture. And have a look at what's been planned for Riverbank to uh, market to Riverbank and I think you'll actually approve of it. Yeah. Members, any further debate about the amendment? <laughs> Councillor Claire and your summit, uh, Councillor Corbell. Just noting that um, I, I believe in July, like in terms of the time frame, we've got the Green City Plan coming to us, which includes the landscaping um, planning. Which, to me, if it's if it's that close, when are we going to do this workshop? Like we chock a block with workshops, and once we've got this for endorsement, how much is this going to affect what's already been done? Very good. Just um, clarify. Thanks. Yeah, just just a point of clarification, if I could, Lord Mayor, the the Green City Plan will certainly be coming to council for consideration in July, but the City Landscaping Plan is an action within that. That won't be coming in July as well. We just need to be really clear about that. Well, I'm I'm happy to defend. Okay, members, any further debate on the motion to defer? Councillor Clare, have a sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I mean, we call ourselves a creative, livable, smart and green city. And with a motion like this, that really does require a whole lot of careful thought, we really do need to put it off so that we don't make any silly mistakes. Otherwise, we're going to end up looking very dumb and our landscape potentially very dead. Members, you have a motion to defer in front of you. Those in favour? Those against? The motion to defer is carried. So members, that becomes the motion as amended. Councillor Antic, sum up. We have a, on a motion as amended to defer. Summed up. Summed up. Oh, okay, well, excellent. Um, no, 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 everyone else has crackled on for longer. Um, well, that's what it is. Um, I'm, I'm, well, God bless you. Um, I, uh, I wonder whether or not we might at some point um, convene a workshop on the ability to have numerous and unnecessary workshops uh, because we, I mean, honest to whatever Lord Mayor, we, we have an innate ability in this chamber to make heavy weather of fairly simple issues and I think we've seen that tonight. But in any event, I'm sure you'll enjoy the workshop and um, we'll talk about it some more because we'll look at that and uh, summed up. Thank you members. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you. Members, item 15.3 we've just done. We go to item 16, so motions without notice. Members, do I have any motions without notice? We don't. Deputy Lord Mayor, you foreshadowed before. Yes, Lord Mayor, I've got a motion without notice. The administration schedule a workshop 
on homelessness at the first available opportunity. We have a second to a Councillor Corbell. Back to you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, unless, do I need to speak to no. members? Okay, then I'm summed up. No, any debate members? No, DLM summed up already. I'm taking it straight to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Workshop will happen. Carried. Members, I've now got a number of items. Yeah. Councillor Mulani. Yeah, 18.1. Okay, thank you. So we've got a number of items which are going to move into confidence. Going to have a mover for 18.1.1. .1. Moved by Councillor Mulaney, seconded by Councillor Moran. Those in favour? Carried. We're going to move item 18.2.1, Councillor Mulaney, seconded by Councillor Vershaw. Those in favour? We carry. Item 18.2.2, Councillor Mulaney? Yes. Seconded by Councillor Corbell. Those in favour? Item 18.2.3, Councillor Mulaney, seconded by Councillor Vershaw. Those in favour? Carried. Item 18.2.4, moved by Councillor Milani, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Those in favour? <laughs> Carried. It's all on the timing, Councillor Wilkinson. Now, ladies and gentlemen, any members of the gallery and administration not central to the issues yet to be debated, can I ask you to leave the council chamber and I thank you for your attendance.
Members, I'm just awaiting for recording to resume. Judy will advise me of that. Okay, members, I formally declare the meeting closed at 9.24 p.m. on Tuesday the 27th of June 2017. Thank you, members. Thank you. 